<laughs> Good evening. Let me call to order the regular City Council meeting for the City of St. Helena for Tuesday, April 11th, 2017th. Mr. Doring, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Gamal, roll call. Council Member Doring? Present. Council Member Ellsworth? Here. Council Member Coberstein? Here. Vice Mayor White? Yes, here. Mayor Galbraith? Here. All right, uh, that takes us to public forum. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address us uh, on matters not on our agenda tonight, and public comment is limited to three minutes. Does anybody wish to address us at public forum? Yes, Ms. please come up to the dice, or up to the uh, podium. Ms. Wilson? My name is Beckley Wilson. For the last two years, I have been the Poet Laureate for Napa County, the first one to come from Northern County. And I live up by Bale Mill. And uh, so it has been a great honor. It seemed like this being the month of arts and the poetry and theater and all kinds of things going on in the county, it seemed that it was appropriate to be here tonight. So I just want to share with you what a privilege this has been. I have had probably close to 20 occasions to be in the public, to be with children, to uh, bless the uh, artwork on the streets of Napa, to be there for the 100th anniversary of the Library of Napa, to be there for the opening of the Calistoga Library, to be there to write a poem for all the members of the nation who have mills or are millers when they were all here at our wonderful Bale Mill last year, and to speak to many, many social and uh, business organizations uh, over the last two years. So I've brought a few pictures to be seen one is uh, several of the items, including the fifth graders who do poetry with me almost every year. Uh, and they were the first one to make me a poet laureate. They made me a poet laureate of their classes in a couple years ago. And every year, for years, they would do artwork and uh, write poems and go and recite them at the coffee shop. And maybe you've been there when they have arrived. And they finally, the last two years, decided to do it with a mic. And then you couldn't get them off. <laughs> so the other is a project that I have just received through the Arts Council, a grant to do a special project with the elementary school here in town where they will receive cameras, they will take pictures of their environment, either national or otherwise, write a poem to it. They will then be exhibited. Uh, the big ex exhibition will go on in the uh, museum in Yontville, and we hope that will be in the beginning of 2018. So it has been a pleasure to be able to share and make the arts of arts more known in the county. So it's my pleasure to be here on this evening when you will receive something for the Arts Month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Elaine Dinan, um, I want to thank the council and the staff for that um, really long, <laughs> exhausting workshop, budget workshop last week. It was as a citizen here in town, it was really edifying to understand all the work that everybody does and, um, and want you all to know that I appreciate it. Um, having said that, um, one of the things that came up was a brief mention of crosswalks and um, there's a, a, a 
intersection that wasn't mentioned, but I think it's it's one that's overdue for a cross, crosswalk, and that is the Childs Avenue to um, across Pope Street. It's a it's a tricky one to navigate if you're walking and you want to head. Um, I guess it's east towards the. Um, Pope Street Bridge. There's an S turn there. Cars come around it quite quickly. And um, there's no sidewalk on, on the one side of the road, so you're forced to cross the road there. So that would be appreciated. Um, the other thing is leaf blowers. They have reared their noisy heads again. Um, and um, I'm just wondering how we can put some teeth in the ordinance. Um, particularly the requirement that the leaf blower has the manufacturer's label on it, um, indicating how, lo how loud it is at so many feet. I had um, reason to believe there was one in the neighborhood that wasn't um, in compliance, and so I um, asked to see the label, and there was not one there. And I, I don't know how, how we can enforce that. Um, one does not want to call the police in... Um, in these times. So um, I, I just hope that there's a way to address that so that the ordinance actually has some meaning. That's Thank it. You. Thanks. I mean, normally code enforcement is complaint driven. That's the reality of it. Uh, but in any event, we'll think more about it. Thank you very much. I, I just want to mention there's water in the back for anybody if they want to, if they're speaking and want to think of water. Hi, um, my name is Catherine Kenny, and along with my husband Tom, we own that pizza place at 1149 Main Street. And I'm here to talk about the water issue. Um, we have uh, two bills that I received. One is uh, November of 2016 to December of 2016, and our water, our sewer base fee was $42. Um, January of 2017 to February of 2017. Our water base fee was eight hundred and forty dollars. Okay, I have no idea why that is. It's a two thousand percent increase. Now, I'm pretty sure that if you guys got a bill in your mail for two thousand percent increase, you'd want to know what was going on too. I know. Excuse me. I know there's other people here that have the same issue, um, and it's just annoying. Uh, you know, we're a mom and pop business. We have you know, been in this business for eight years up here. I believe our classification has changed from a regular business to a restaurant, even though we've been a restaurant for the eight years that we've been here. So I'm not quite sure why it went up 2,000%. So hopefully you guys right. can figure it out because it sucks. Well, uh, please you. be in touch with the finance department and they will guide you through it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Polly Ogden. <clears throat> I live uh, on the northern end of town and um, next to or, or in Quail Meadows Homeowner Association, also close to Las Alcobas um, Hotel. And we've, we've worked through many issues with them, and I really appreciate how they've worked with us on some privacy issues. Um, the construction is now pretty much finished, and what's happened is that the employees are now there, and they're parking all the way on Main Street, turning the corner, and all the way up El Elmhurst, well, halfway through to Elmhurst. It's creating a horrible traffic danger situation at the corner of Elmhurst and Main. In order to turn left to go north, one has to inch out and hope to God nobody's coming because you can't see anybody. Um, it's 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 really terrible. And then also the neighborhood that has been you know subjected to this has now become a parking lot. And there ought to have been in the planning and in the in the agreement with the hotel there should have been something for employee parking. And if there isn't, I think there should be at this point. So I'd like to leave it at that. All right. Thank, thank you, you thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Debbie Fredlizio, my daughter Jennifer and I have Gilwoods. Sorry, I'm really nervous, never been before the council. Um, I Don't be nervous, again. we're okay. <laughs> okay thank you. Um, I, actually, I went to the last meeting, you guys are great. Um, 
the um, I'm, I'm with the pizza place. Okay, so we're all now restaurants, just restaurants. There's no big, small. I have a 55 seat restaurant, and I am paying the same sewer base sewer rate of $840 as the other restaurants that have 110, 150. It doesn't matter. We're all restaurants, and this is not fair. My bill last year, I paid the city $8,000 for water and sewer. This year, it's going to be $16,000. I can't pay that. How am I supposed to pay that? I either raise my prices and lose customers. I don't donate to the city anymore for schools or, or any kind of um, local charities. I stop paying health insurance for my employees. I don't give them raises and lose them. You, this city, by doing this, has put my restaurant in a dilemma. That I don't know how to figure out. I don't know how to come up with eight thousand, and it's going to increase for the next five years. This is not a one-time thing. It's too hard for us small restaurants, any small businesses. We're all suffering. This has been a tough year with all the road construction and weather, and Napa with their million-dollar campaign to say, stay in Napa, we, don't ha we have it all, and we don't have the traffic, and we don't have the construction. Stay in Napa. So they're spending millions of dollars on that, and we have a city that has increased our bill. Mine, w mine went up over 100%. And it's too, too much. So really, we need to look at this. I know you guys inherited this. I know it's not your fault. But you can't put us all out of business to fix the problem. It's just not going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mike Griffin, Park Street, St. Helena. Uh, back on the issue of the parking for the Las Acobas, uh, the construction has been done now for probably a week or so, and they kind of insured some of the neighbors and the, the Quayas and stuff that there'd be no more parking on Pratt Avenue or around the area once the construction quits. Well, that's baloney. They're there just as much as they were when the construction was going on. And they're up Elmhurst, Main Street's plugged, uh, Park Street, the whole nine yards. And nobody's addressing this. I mean, we brought this to the council here, I don't know how many times, you know, it's getting, getting old. Uh, you got other projects coming on board here. Uh, Behringer's, uh, April 18th, their major project. It's not just change a couple of fermentation tanks. It's a whole blown out new production facility for numerous wineries, even out of this county. Uh, the council, you're going to hear the CIA here on the 27th, if not the first part of the month. Uh, I think it's time to just put a moratorium on What's going on until we address the issue of that intersection, which you guys might start calling it Blood Alley. I went over there today for about 45 minutes or so, and there's at least, well, I stood on the corner of, uh, of Pratt Avenue, Maine. I consider there was at least 10 close calls. I mean, locking up brakes. One car went sideways because it was raining. And, you, you know, you guys didn't cause this, but it's there. And so I suggest you just, you know, maybe put a stop on all major construction within a half mile radius of that intersection and that whole surrounding neighborhood. And then another thing here, this $300 or 300 foot notice that you send out, I got this three days ago for the Behringer uh, project that they're bringing before the Planning Commission here. I live probably a block and a half, two blocks. Three neighbors live within stone and throwing of the project have never received anything. So most people up and down Pratt Avenue has never received this from the city. So that's, you know, people don't get the information. I mean, I don't know what the problem is. I've been yelling and screaming. I never received one. So you, I guess you took all them people off the list. So I get one now. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Thank you. All right. I think the, Thank you. the planning director is making a note. My name is Charles Hall. I own the St. Lena Coin Laundry. Um, which it, it's coincidentally is next to the pizza place. I was actually sounding, I was sounding, feeling a little envious there. My t base sewer rate went to $970 a month, which is $10,000 a year. The two problems, one is that I'm being charged for the water that goes out, which will double in the next five years. I've had this conversation in Healdsburg and Napa where I have a laundry. I can't get relief from the water that doesn't go down the sewer. Wet clothes come out of the washer, they have water in them, they go into the dryer, it evaporates. I'm still charged for the amount of water coming in as if that was the same amount of water that went out. The dilemma I face is I become 
uncompetitive with other laundries because I have to raise my rates to the point where it becomes worthwhile to go to Napa or becomes worthwhile to go to one of the, well, not very many closer, Calistoga is the only other closest laundry. It affects me very little to the point where I need to raise my prices to match my reasonable margin. I make a good living off that. It affects the people mostly that have to use my laundry, have no other facilities. You know, it's, I have customers that use 10 machines a day. I raise 50 cents. That's $5, $20 a month, $250 a month out of the people who can least afford to pay it. And I cannot, I can't, I can, my other choice is to close the laundry, which at this point is closed. I'm waiting for the building commission to issue the permits for our repairs. So I just wish that they would look at a way of mitig either mitigating this or stretching it out so that we don't see these incredible increases in such a short period of time. And in five years from now, hopefully I won't be standing here again saying, I'm closing my laundry, I can't make any money. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Anthony McKelly. I live at 1125 Cornella. I'm a part owner in a family business. We own the ice cream store on Oak Avenue, and we also own the building where the olive oil company is between the market and the model bakery. Uh, the water rate for the ice cream store was $40. You raised it to $800. So it's probably more than 2,000% increase. We negotiated with the city because all they do is wash ice cream co scoopers. But we're considered a restaurant now. And so they reduced it to 540 for us. Now our tenant on Main Street is going to leave us. And so we have another tenant that on Main Street we have the olive oil company is there. But we also have wine tasting. And they want to serve some cheeses there and have it like a cafe. I was told by the planner because we're going to be for the planning commission the end of the month or next month and that anybody who serves a liquid item or a donut will charge the $800 and this is not fair you're driving everybody out of business here by this thing and I and I've asked where does this $800 come from nobody has an answer do you people have an answer or is somebody else running the city that we don't know about somebody has to do something and we're about the cheapest rent in town but yet we can't even keep our tenants there because of what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm John Hawkins, 1234 Hudson. My problems would seem to pale in comparison with everyone else's. I want to ask you to think about noise. Um, a house was remodeled next to me on Allen Street about a year ago that has the new upscale slick stuff. Uh, it's got a pool and a spa and an outdoor kitchen and fire table and overhead lights and uh, heaters and expansive patio. And when this all went in, this is right underneath a bedroom, I said, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, the other night, Thursday night, there was a corporate event there. Uh, I was kind of looking in disbelief because this is a residential neighborhood. There must have been 120 people, 125 people. Uh, buses brought them in. There's a band, um, this big outdoor screen with um, karaoke, uh, lots of awards, corporate awards made, uh, lots of drunken shouting and fist pumping. Um, and so I, I called, after about half an hour, I called the police and said, uh, you know, what, is this okay? Is, how does this work? And they said, well, gee, we don't have a, we don't actually have a permit for that. They're supposed to have a permit. So well, would you please go over there and ask them to, you know, cool it. So two hours later, nothing had happened. So I called the police again and said, oh, we've been real busy. Uh, so, okay. Then a half an hour later, I called back and they said, oh, the officer went by and uh, asked them to be quiet and and left. So, of course, nothing changed at all. Um, and this t this was really kind of in your face to me. I mean, these people, I don't want to get into that, but they don't live here. It's a second or third home. It's on VRBO. Who knows where they live? But this is, uh, this is, a, this is a corporate event on a Thursday night with no permit, with no courtesy of telling their neighbors what was going on. Um, it sort of brought up everything that, that 
I'm concerned about how our town is changing and it's a lot of second homes and whether people who live here in those second homes have any regard for the people who actually do live here. Uh, and my understanding is that whatever Norris ordinances there are, there are no penalties whatsoever. I mean, you, get, you don't get fined, you don't get power cut off, nothing happens. <laughs> and, and I was so mad. I mean, I was thinking of my own little vigilante action, you know. I mean, I don't know. know what, you know, egging people or squirting a hose over the fence. And then, of course, I'll get in a jam if that happens. Yeah. But, but don't waste my water. Exactly. I can't afford to do that. But there's, there's stuff. There's the Davies Winery that's got this rooftop thing that's coming up. You've got this new Las Escobas that's noise. You know, we moved here for a reason. It's for the peace and quiet. Uh, and so I hope you take that in consideration in terms of how you deal with people who do this sort of stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. The council has asked uh, the city council to take a look at the noise ordinance and at the penalties uh, in an effort to, um, to uh, put more teeth into them. All right, thanks. Well, that's on BRBO. I wonder if that is one of our short-term rentals or something like that. The, we should get the address at least right. at a minimum to do further. Um, it's 1217, Allen, and it's a 30-day BRBO, which, as we know, is a joke. Okay. Any other public comment? Okay. Uh, let me uh, close uh, the public forum. And uh, the next is, uh, item is uh, reports by staff and city council, future agenda items, and AB 1234 reports. Uh, Mr. Brown, let me begin with you. We had a closed session. I assume that there was no reportable action. That's correct. The city council met this afternoon in a special closed session uh, uh, to discuss the item designated on the agenda for that evening. Uh, no reportable action was taken. All right. Uh, Mr. Pinnell. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I have a couple of uh, items this evening, a couple of housekeeping items and one announcement. The council retreat has been scheduled for Friday, April the 21st, starting at 9 a.m. at Southbridge. Um, that's open to the public. It'll be calendared as a special meeting by the city council. And the... Uh, Facilitator thought that the session should last to about 3 or 4 o'clock that afternoon. The second item that I'd like to bring to your attention was discussed at our staff meeting this morning. You'll notice on consent this evening there are three different um, encroachment permit uh, fee waiver requests. And it's I, I see no end of these encroachment permit fee waivers coming. Um, if there's no objection, I, I think the staff, the city attorney and, and I will prepare a, a resolution or an ordinance that would delegate um, to the, the staff the ability to waive fees for charitable service organizations that are local that seem to benefit the entire community through their activities. Um, so that I'll put that on a future agenda unless there's some profound objection to that. Otherwise, they'll continue to kind of clutter up our agenda. I think it makes a lot of sense to okay. do that. And the third item I have is an announcement. I'd like to announce that Eric Almond smithies has been promoted to Public Works Director for the City of St. Helena. <laughs> right. We conducted a statewide recruitment effort and convened an oral board last week and uh, Erica came in number one in the opinion of each Raider. I'm just real proud to have her on the staff and be able to promote her to this department head position. Congratulations, Erica. Yeah, by all means. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mitz. Yeah. Mayor, council members, members of the public, I have a few different dates that I just wanted to make everyone aware of to get on your calendars. The first is April 17th, which is next Monday. It is from 9 to 11, and this is the ad hoc committee to address the water wastewater rate study. So I do encourage um, as much participation as possible. Yeah, I believe this meeting is at Vin Vintage Hall. I believe we have some scheduling conflicts with Vintage Hall. If they are not at Vintage, Ho Vintage Hall, it will be either at the library or at at the firehouse, uh, the 
the city's website will have all that information and we are also recording all the meetings if we are unable to broadcast some live because of other considerations with napa valley tv we are going to have them available so you can view them um, through the city's website so i wanted to make everyone aware uh, definitely a good time to come understand the rates we're looking at um, the methodologies used for the rate study, including the CIP projects that are on the study, the methodologies used by our rate consultant that we hired, um, in addition to financing methodologies. So we're basically we're using this time to use the ad hoc committee to reexamine everything. So I encourage everyone to um, to be there. What was the date again? Um, April seventeenth, so Monday, this upcoming Monday, at nine a.m. On April 25th, I wanted to make everybody aware we are going to be presenting our audited financials for our fiscal year 15-16. So if anybody is interested in seeing what our financials were for fiscal year 15-16, that is going to be on April 25th. On May 2nd is our budget workshop, and that is going to be an all-day affair from 9 a.m. to approximately 5 p.m. And I believe, again, that is at Vintage Hall. We did secure the location for that day. And then the last date is May 23rd. Uh, that is a date we have been working on a forensic audit um, to review the overall expenditures for the flood control project. And that um, we are finalizing the document right now, and the forensic auditor will be here at that council meeting doing the presentation for the public and for the city council. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Ms. Romero? Nothing to report, Mayor. All right. Uh, Mr. Housh? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just have a few uh, brief issues. First, uh, I was informed by Calistoga Affordable Housing that they are planning a groundbreaking ceremony this Friday at the Pope Street property um, for the Turley Flats Affordable Housing Project, so they are moving forward with that. That's at 11 a.m., as I, I believe so. I believe yeah. so. Uh, and also just want to let the public know of that. And then also there is a, a Senate bill moving through the legislative process, SB 649, which is uh, a regulation. It's a draft currently uh, proposing to make some changes to the telecommunication regulation, so cellular equipment. And it proposes to allow cellular and telecommunication infrastructure as a permitted use, including within the city right-of-way. Uh, and essentially what that would do is take the city's discretion away from limiting um, the ability for telecommunication companies to put their infrastructure onto our infrastructure within the city. Um, it is being opposed by the League of Cities, uh, and our department definitely has concerns over it, but it appears to be moving relatively quickly through the legislative process, so I would just encourage all who are interested in looking at that to take a look. And staff is trying to get a letter before the council to allow you to review it and um, and hopefully sign it and send it into the committee before it gets voted on. It was um, unanimously approved by the Senate Energy, Utilities, and Communication Committee last week. However, they sent it back to the Government Finance Committee um, for re-review. So and I'll provide the Council with some information on that. The, the League has a, a, a form letter that the Councils can use, but I would also encourage anyone in the city, uh, citizens who are interested in that, to take a look. All right, very good. Public Works Director Smithies. Thank you. Um, I would like to report back on uh, last meeting you requested, this council requested that I look into the intersection of Pratt and, and uh, Main Street. Uh, right now there still are, there is still some construction going on out there, so we continue to monitor it. But we, I did get a call from our local police department and our chief fire, I mean, uh, Chief Sorensen um, about Elmhurst. And we do have a line of sight issue there with cars parking up to the turning curb, the radius there. So we'd like to come back to council on April 25th for a um, red zone authorization. I'd like to try to come re outreach to the, to the um, residents along there so that they might have concerns about um, painting the curb red, but they may not. But um, I do believe there is a concern, a valid concern there, and, and we should move forward with, with painting the curb red on, on both sides of that Elmhurst. Good. That's it. All right. Uh, Ms. Crichton, did I see you here? Am I missing anybody else back there? All right, uh, Ms. Coberstein. Just one thing, I'd like us to consider putting together an agenda forecast that appears on the website. Um, I was interested here tonight uh, from the notice that was waved around that there's some Behringer thing going to the Planning Commission. Um, I think typically here people find out maybe four or five days ahead of time you know, when the packets actually come out. Uh, I think it would be good if for both the Planning Commission and the Council, 
without giving specified dates, we could at least indicate what's in the pipeline. You know, what is the council going to be looking at over the next month or so? And similarly for the planning commission, to the extent we can. That, that data is readily available. We review it every week at our staff meetings, charting the course of these topics that we plan to bring before council on a, on a kind of a mechanical basis. And um, so I, I see no problem in, in trying to reach out to the public so they can see what is in the pipeline, perhaps not the precise date that the right. council will have right. it calendared for deliberation, but it's the information we track right now. Well, not only the public, but the city council should get that information. I, I don't want to be called on something that I don't know about. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, all right, good. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth? I have, a, I have a number of things, and I'm going to be very stern today, which is not my usual nature, but the upset that I feel within myself is so deep because I have listened over the last number of weeks and the last number of months to our citizens and our residents and our community saying that there's something wrong here and they have not been responded to in a, in a timely manner. I asked some people to come here from out of town today so that they could see what we're dealing with here. What we do here affects the county outside us. What happens in the county affects us here. We're seeing many problems. The wastewater problem is one where a 2,000% increase is unacceptable. Whatever, and to hear that we're going to study it while these people contemplate going out of business is unacceptable. It should have been studied beforehand. We need to make a, an immediate interim action to protect these businesses, these people in our community. That's a problem. Another problem is the Los Alcobas parking. How does a major hotel get approved without employee parking? How does that happen in a city with a professional planning staff and a major hotel developer? How does that happen? It, it's a problem. It's creating a safety problem. It's creating a safety problem that's moving into a school zone. The, the noise issue that Mr. Hawkins brought up, I went there and I saw a tour bus loading and unloading into a neighborhood where there was a major commercial event happening. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to our long-term investors, our residents, our small businesses. It's unacceptable. Now, there's a frustration as well because... People, there's, a, there's a disconnect in the communication. People are feeling they're not getting the information they need about projects, large projects that are going to impact their lives. Frankly, I'm not getting the information either. And we're in a, in a situation where we're moving to a new city manager, and I hope that that stabilizes the situation. But the problem is we keep doing more and more and more, and we cannot enforce compliance in what we already have. So I look at this, I look at this the way it's a systemic problem. It's not a bunch of different problems. It's a systemic problem. Something in our system is dysfunctioning. And we've got to address what that is. And we've got to do it together. And I know that everybody is working as hard as they can and doing as much as they can. But we have a problem when our small businesses are on the brink, when our fixed income people are on the brink because of, of rate increases. These are our precious assets, and we are putting them in a position where they are wondering if they are going to be able to continue to be here, and it is unacceptable. It is unacceptable when we have other options. So I look at it, I look at it the way my father would have looked at it, like fixing a motor that you know something's wrong with, and you hear it, and you know something's wrong, and I hear it. And I'll tell you how angry I am. I'm angry because I have 50, 60 people giving me their anger, telling me they're angry, and I, it coming into me. So, we listen to the motor. We know there's something wrong. We don't know what it is. We've got to turn off the motor 
and we got to open it up and we got to figure out what is wrong here because these are our citizens, our residents, our investors, and we have to protect them like they were our own family. And we're going to start doing it now. Now, I've got just a few more things. Water. I, we have a, a, a ad hoc committee. Who is not on that committee and who is not in, involved in this are our largest users. The largest corporate users of our water are the largest users. They should be involved in this. They're part of this discussion. We have a problem here. They need to be here and be part of the solution. So, anybody who knows who they are, they can get in touch with me and we can start discussing it because we have opportunities for the next 50 to 100 years to set up an incredible system here, a water system, a tertiary water system. We can do it with them. They are our water partners. They are. So we should be doing it with them. They have the means. Why are we talking about being broke and we see these, these entities thriving? Where are they? Let's, they need to be here to work with it. We are the water provider for them. And if we're not careful, I have very deep concerns about water privatization here in Napa Valley. And that will be a disaster to all of our water security. The last thing is, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I mentioned uh, when I was running, I had this idea about how we could use um, some kind of winemaking uh, thing as a revenue generator. And it's a low impact idea. I haven't heard from one of our local winemakers. And when I was growing up here, our local winemakers, um, you know, I think would, would re have responded to that challenge. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear from somebody. So that's what I'm going to say. Um, our problems, we need to stop the engine. We need to look everywhere and find out what's wrong because there's a systemic problem here. And I will tell you this. I will get down to it. We will get down to it. We will find it. Because we will not risk your business. We will not risk losing you as a citizen here. We will not risk it. I will not risk it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Doring. I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we... We do have the retreat coming up, and I'm sure that some of these items will be an appropriate subject for the retreat. So, uh, all right. Uh, next item on our agenda is uh, an update from the Transportation Sustainability Committee. Yes, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I think after that, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Okay, good. Um, my name is Mike Chiswick, and for the last little while, I've been serving as the chairman of the newly combined... You want to move that microphone over just a tad? Oh, so, sure. Yeah, thank you. The newly combined um, Active Transportation and Sustainability Committees, uh, and I'm here to give you a brief update on our, our work. Uh, some of the things we've been doing recently, uh, one has been working to figure out how we could help support uh, Bike to Work Day. That's May 11th. That's a, uh, it's a Bay wide, Bay Area wide um, effort to get people to bike to work. We recognize that in St. Helena we have a slightly unusual situation where a significant number of people who work here don't live here, so it's a little harder for them to bike to work. But we're, we're looking to find other ways where people could uh, bike to school or bike to the gym, do whatever they can to encourage biking. Well, there's a proclamation about this coming up later on, I, I, I know, on the, on the agenda. Another item we've been looking at are um, electronic vehicle charging stations. We've been looking at the city and trying to think what would be the, might be the best place to put them, and also looking at opportunities to get grants that would cover the cost of installation. But we think that charging stations for, economic, for um, electric vehicles are a great way to show our ecology-minded citizens, that our, our, our residents and people who work here and visit will get an opportunity to charge their cars. 
Next item we've been talking about a lot is bike safety and etiquette. Uh, in light of a couple of things, the eventual arrival of the Vine Trail and also the emergence of uh, bicycle-based wine touring, we, uh, it brought to our attention that we really we should work on ways of encouraging bike safety and, and etiquette. Uh, what we, the committee would like the City Council to do is approve a letter of support for Calistoga's TDA3 grant that would allow Napa Bike to have an outreach and education program here in St. Helena and for the North Valley. We think that's uh, a great idea and a good way to encourage bicycle safety and, um, and etiquette. Uh, that's, uh, that's a consent item uh, tonight. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, um, with respect to future work, uh, because we, we're a newly combined committee, we've been working on a mission statement uh, that would uh, reflect what the both committees were, wanted to do, and obviously any input we could get would be great. And finally, we've been evaluating the costs and benefits of the city developing a special event permit uh, because that would obviate the need for encroachment permits for public, especially bicycle-oriented uh, events that we think would be, would be facilitated by a special permitting process that would be easier to get. So that's all I had to say. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service to the community. All right. Uh, no staff briefing. That takes us to uh, presentations and public recognitions. And uh, the first uh, of these is a proclamation on immigration. And uh, I'm going to read it. And I would really invite and enjoy if all members of the council could come up and stand behind me uh, as I read this. Okay, good. <laughs> we can even help you read it. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, uh, the proclamation is entitled Community Statement on Immigration, and it tracks the proclamation that was adopted by the County of Napa, uh, and I believe the City of Calistoga at this point, but all cities are going to adopt or have adopted similar uh, proclamations. This was a county, citywide, city's effort here. Uh, Whereas the entire Napa County community, county, cities, and towns, as well as our law enforcement agencies and businesses, nonprofit and faith communities, recognize the long and rich history of immigrants who have contributed to our local economy. They have become leaders in agriculture, tourism, education, business, health care, and other professions. And whereas our county is a diverse one with foreign-born residents comprising over 23% of the county's total population. They annually account for over one billion of the region's gross domestic uh, product. And whereas the building of a welcoming community is fundamental to a vibrant and inclusive Napa County, we want to assure immigrants, refugees, and other newcomers opportunities for empowerment, civic engagement, safety, and freedom from discrimination, oppression, and violence. And Whereas it is important for our leadership to make a statement of support to the immigrant community and for our county to be a place of trust and safety for immigrants who live and work in our communities, and whereas a relationship of trust between California's immigrant residents and our local agencies, including law enforcement and schools, is essential to effective execution of basic local functions, and whereas ensuring the health, well-being, and civil rights of all people regardless of their immigrant status, immigration status, through a dynamic and responsive process that respects the community's diversity is a shared responsibility of Napa County leadership. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, and on behalf of all council members, proclaim that we aspire to be a model for inclusion and equity for all populations, including immigrants, refugees, and other newcomers, and are committed to supporting the ongoing inclusion and long-term economic and social integration of newcomers and to demonstrate values of unity and acceptance, dated April 11, 2017. Thank you. Thank you. Now, with respect to all proclamations, uh, at some point we will get the formal copies and deliver them to the appropriate persons. Our city clerk is out tonight, and uh, 
and somehow that part of it got uh, overlooked, but we will get there. The next proclamation uh, is uh, uh, respect to Bike to Work Day, and Mr. Chizik. Uh, I can stand you? Sure. <laughs> side by side. Thank you. You could say a few words, but you've already said a few I words. Said words so you could say the words. <laughs> okay. Uh, City of St. Helena proclamation proclaim May as Bike Month and May 11th as Bike to Work Day. Uh, whereas the City of St. Helena is committed to making our community safer and more convenient for bicycle commuters and encouraging increased bicycle use, and whereas the City of St. Helena Bicycle Plan adopted in 2012 identifies benefits of bicycle ridership, including reduced congestion, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and the public health benefits of active transportation, and whereas riding a bicycle for transportation or recreation is a fun well, we've got a word here. Endorphin doesn't sound quite right to me, but uh, endorphin-filled yes. endorphin way to get around. <laughs> and riding to work just three days a week can have significant health benefits, including improved cardiovascular strength and weight loss. And whereas increasing number of visitors to our community are using bicycles and other active transportation for trips to our local hotels, restaurants, tasting rooms, parks, and open spaces, and whereas programs like Bike to Work Day and Bike to School Day are an important opportunity to both educate and encourage members of our community, and whereas the City of St. Helena prioritizes the safety of all of our residents and visitors and encourages both bicycle riders and vehicle drivers to share the road and be respectful of other road users, and whereas the City of St. Helena encourages everyone to participate in Bike to Work Day on May 11, 2017, and Napa Bike Fest on Saturday, May 6th, and to consider bicycling for short trips more often. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Bike Month and May 11, 2017 as Bike to Work Day in the City of St. Helena, dated April 11, 2017. Great idea. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our next proclamation, this is a busy meeting for proclamations, uh, is April Arts Month, and uh, it's Ms. Kelly. Yeah. All right, April Arts Month, April 2017. Whereas the month of April has been recognized as a countywide celebration of the arts and local culture, known as Napa Valley Arts in April, by dozens of arts and cultural organizations, hundreds of individuals and businesses across the county, as well as by the agencies of Visit Napa Valley and Arts Council Napa Valley for seven years. Whereas the arts and culture embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind, whereas the arts and culture enhance and enrich the lives of every resident, whereas hundreds of residents from each town and city came together in the creation of the County of Napa's Adopted Community Cultural Plan, which has been in place since 2008, and endorsed the following cultural core values for all of Napa County. Self-expression is everyone's birthright. The arts serve as a common language. The arts are critical to a healthy economy. The arts allow us to access to our past, to ourselves, and to each other. And the arts give us a sense of place and of home. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, do hereby proclaim April as Arts Month in City of St. Helena, and call upon our citizens to celebrate and promote arts and culture in our county and to specifically encourage the greater participation by those said citizens in taking action for arts uh, and culture in their towns and cities, dated April 11th. Now, would you like to say a few words? Okay, very good. Hello, I'm Shelley Hannon. I'm chair of Arts Council Napa Valley. And I just really wanted to thank the City Council for this proclamation. The Arts Council is very grateful that all five of our towns got on board for Arts in April. And these proclamations just make it very official. So thank you. And I look forward to this coming weekend's Art in the Streets. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, and one final proclamation, National Library Week. Mari? <laughs> Very good. Oh, come on, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, National Library Week, April 9 to 15. All right. Okay. National Library Week, April 9th to 15th, 2017. Whereas libraries are not just about what we have for people, but what we do for and with people. Whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions, and library workers and librarians fuel efforts to better their communities, campuses, and schools. Whereas libraries are evolving in order to serve their communities and to continue to fulfill their role in leveling the playing field for all who seek information and access to technologies. Whereas libraries and librarians open up a world of possibilities through assisting with technology and resources, innovative programming, and the power of reading and literacy. Whereas libraries and librarians are looking beyond their traditional roles and providing more opportunities for community engagement and to deliver new services that connect closely with patrons' needs. Whereas libraries support democracy and affect social change through their commitment to provide equitable access to information for all library users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. Whereas libraries, librarians, library workers, and supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, uh, Mayor Alan Galbraith, proclaim National Library Week, April 9th through 15th, 2017. Uh, I encourage all residents to visit the library this week and explore what's new at your library, our library, and engage with uh, our librarian because librarians, uh, libraries transform. Dated April 11th, 2017. Very good. Yeah. Like to <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to thank the City Council and the residents of St. Helena for supporting their library and our goal of educating and transforming lives and in helping support this amazing community we share. Uh, National Library Week is a chance to celebrate libraries and their staff who transform lives through free access to technology, information, literacy, diverse collections, and opportunities for community engagement. And I'll do my pitch. The, this week highlights the way libraries have become people places, involving from mere repositories for bound items into community gathering spaces and information centers which offer everything from bilingual stories, art classes, tax help, computer help, and more. Um, at the library this Thursday, uh, Wild St. Helena is all about beavers. Um, spring break activities next week include Tuesday's St. Helena Rocks. <laughs> um, come and paint a rock with us. And next Thursday at 4, we do a sing-along with pinwheel making that uh, we're planning to put around the library. Um, and all of these, and then after that at 6.30 will be a succulent and seed swap. So, in celebration of Earth Day. Um, and I'd like to thank the Friends and Foundation, which makes the, these events and so many more things possible at the library. Um, last but not least, today, um, the Tuesday of National Library Week, is also National Library Workers Day. And I would like to recognize the hard work and dedication of the staff of the St. Helena Library. The library would not be the unique place it is without them and their creativity, energy, enthusiasm, and commitment. Uh, that's Lynn Albright, Kitty Collins, Carolyn Coy, Kim Farmer, Janice Humphreys, Clara Ibarra, Megan Jones, Kate McBride, Mariah McGuire, Casey McConnell, Mar Mar Mario Martinez, sorry, Mari, <laughs> Cecilia Rotho, and of course, Leslie Stanton. Uh, they work from four hours a week to 40 hours a week to make the library what it is. So thank you, and thank you. Oh, do you want to have a few words? Yeah, go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Jenny O'Connor. I'm the Executive Director of the Up Valley Family Centers. And I just want to thank the City Council for your proclamation on immigration. We uh, serve uh, 3,400 individuals a year. Many of those are immigrants. In the past months, we've received a lot of calls and walk-ins of immigrant members of our community who are concerned with um, changes in tone of policy at the federal level. And the message of the proclamation is very important to our local community. I also want to thank Mayor Galbraith and Chief Mboden, as well as the St. Helena Unified School District, for coming to a community meeting that we held last month with over 70 residents, uh, having the opportunity to understand what their rights are and ask questions. And I believe that people went away feeling better about the situation, but it's also uh, an ever-changing situation. And so um, I really uh, think it's important that we have strong messages of support for everyone in our community. And I really want to commend you for um, your action tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. By all means. Hi. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the City Council. I'm Napa County Bicycle Board Member Emily Cox. And um, thanks for supporting bike riding in St. Helena. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think that takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, the consent calendar. Let me take a look. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read off the items on consent, uh, and as usual, any member of the council or any member of the public can pull an item, in which case we will go through it. Uh, 8.1. Uh, consideration of proposed approval of regular meeting minutes of February 28, 2017. 8.2, consideration of proposed approval of a resolution to temporary uh, street closures on April 14, 2017 for the RLS Parent Group and St. Helena Schools Foundation Run Big St. Helena event, waiving the encroachment fee of $200 and authorizing city staff to assist with road closures. 8.3, Approve letter of support for the City of Calistoga's Transportation Development Act Article 3 grant application for bicycle education for the lodging and wine industries in Up Valley communities, including the greater Calistoga and St. Helena areas. I would like to pull that one, please. All right. When I said Article 3, that's TDA uh, Article 3, TDA being Transportation Development Act. Uh, 8.4, consideration of proposed approval of a resolution adopting a revised conflict of interest code for the City of St. Helena and rescinding resolution 2015-34. 8.5, consideration of a resolution approving the use of the fire station parking lot for Earth Day activities by the City, by the St. Helena Chamber of Commerce and waiver the encroachment fee in the amount of $200. 8.6, consideration of a resolution approving a contract consultant services agreement with Interwest to provide professional building official building permit plan check and building inspection services for a total contract amount not to exceed $75,000. 8.7, consideration of a resolution approving amendment number two for a consultant services agreement with M Group to provide professional planning services for an additional amount of $100,000 and for a total contract amount not to exceed $200,000. I'd like to pull that one, please. All right. 8.8, 8, resolution authorizing use of general fund reserves in the amount of 34000 and approval of a budget adjustment, 35, a budget, of a budget adjustment of $34,000 to account 101-4900-2145 for parking citation amount due to the County of Napa, Auditor Controller's Office for monies due from fiscal year 2011 through fiscal year 2016 for parking citation revenue. 8.9, consideration of a resolution approving the Arts Council Napa Valley to host arts in the Lyman Street, uh, in the streets at Lyman Park on Saturday, April 15, 2017, from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. and waive the encroachment permit fee of $200 and the noise permit fee of, two, of $25. 8.10, uh, consideration, uh, uh, excuse me, consider a resolution for the approval of a budget adjustment using water and wastewater net position in amount not to exceed $5,400 for fiscal year 20, 
2017 for the recording and televising of the ad hoc uh, utility rate meetings. 8.11, consideration proposed approval of resolution approving the city manage and execute a production agreement with Zambelli Fireworks in the amount of $40,000 for a city-sponsored fireworks show located in Crane Park on July 4th and covering $19,020 from the general fund fiscal year 2017-2018 operating budget. 8.12, resolution authorizing a budget adjustment of $1,000 to fund 286, which is bocce for fiscal year 2016 2017 to be split between accounts 286 4728 2215 and 286 4728 2230 for additional bocce expenses. So at this point, the chair would entertain a motion to approve items 8.1, 8.2, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.8, 8.9, 8.10, 8.11, .8 .8 .8 .8 and 8.12. So moved. Second. Ms. Cabrera, roll call, please. Councilmember Doring? Yes. White? Yes. Uh, Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Uh, Ellsworth? Yes. Coberstein? Yes. All right, that takes us back to 8.3, uh, which is approval of a letter uh, uh, relating to the TDA 3 grant application. And uh, the staff person on that is. Oh, there she is, Ms. Prakowski. Okay, I'm like good. a little ninja tonight. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this item before you is uh, for you to support a grant application that is to be submitted by the City of Calistoga um, to work in partnership with the City of St. Helena to help provide some bike safety education to the Up Valley area. Uh, this is a small grant. It's $12,000, um, which is why the City of Calistoga has agreed to apply and be the fiscal agent. Um, its purpose is to bring together a forum of um, business owners, interested parties uh, to encourage safe bicycling in the Up Valley area. Um, and so that's focusing in on areas that are safe in our communities, as well as encouraging, you know, good education, whether that's helmets or um, uh, riding bicycles appropriately, good hand signals, uh, things along those lines. The city of Calistoga, in addition, will be hosting a separate uh, bike workshop that's focused on uh, increasing cycling opportunities within their community. With that, I can take any questions. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Ellsworth, do you have any questions? Yeah. You know, this um, came out of the Active Transportation uh, Committee, which is an excellent committee that, that I luckily, or however, I'm sort of the, the liaison. Um, and I've been to two meetings on this, and I, I guess I, I tried to make it clear in the first one, and I might not have mentioned it in the second one, but my concern is that that this needs to address impacts from the combination of bicycle tourism with wine tourism. So if we're getting people on bicycles, touring to wineries, um, drinking along the way, we've seen problems in the past, and I think it needs to be somehow put in here. Uh, I wrote this little phrase that says, including discussion of possible impacts from bicycle wine tourism, includes, including overconsumption and intoxication, as well as discussion of enforcement methods. One of the issues um, is we, another part of this is that we keep hearing about the vine trail, but we really don't know what the plan is. And I think the residents of town, the citizens here, uh, it's, it's one of these issues where we hear about something, but we really don't know what it is. And so I think information for our community about what exactly is the plan of the Vine Trail, we need to get that. That's a little bit of a separate issue, but it ties in because if we're starting to go to wineries and hotels saying, hey, how are you guys going to do bicycle tourism? I think at the same time we have to discuss possible impacts of particularly large groups of people who um, come to Napa Valley to mm -hmm to imbibe and what does that do when you put them on bicycles and send them out along their way so that's where I am I think there needs to be some mention of that the tasting room operators are one of the key constituencies that we'll be doing outreach to and encouraging to come uh, to these workshops for exactly the reasons that you just mentioned, Councilmember Ellsworth. Um, at the direction of Council, I'm happy to add in additional language into the letter before you hopefully approve it and it's signed. All right. Let me see whether there's any public comment, and then we'll come back to that. Yes. 
it's great to see so much enthusiasm for bike riding here in town, but um, I just want to remind everybody that um, uh, within the city limits, there are only class three bicycle routes, meaning that there's really you know, nothing protecting a bicycle rider from traffic. And um, I'd like to see a commitment to creating, at the very least, some class two bike lanes um, that would make biking to work, biking to school, biking to the grocery store, um, safer, a safer experience for all the residents of the um, of St. Helena. I'm not sure this is the right place to present that idea, but um, I think it's something that definitely needs to be addressed, especially since there was so much talk about um, bicycling this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, probably some of that's in the bicycle plan uh, that we adopted some time back uh, that we'll going to be a slow effort to get that accomplished, but uh, in any event, uh, any further public comment? Okay, let me close the public comment. Uh, any uh, further uh, discussion on uh, council members uh, elsewhere suggestion? Uh, I would be fine with, with Jeff's language. Um, and to your point of not knowing what the Vine Trail uh, plan is, um, I I believe you can go on the Vine Trails um, website and see the entire plan. And I also believe that on the NVTA's website, it's got uh, all the information about the future of the Vine Trail. So, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Uh, Council Member Ellsworth, would you either be able to repeat that for me slowly or email it to me after the meeting? You've offered me some very precise you. language. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, why don't we uh, approve this? Uh, you're going to email the language, and you'll give her a little editorial judgment to make in terms of writing it such that your thoughts are communicated. Is that very good? Thank you. That works. Okay. Thank you. So at this point, the chair would entertain a motion to approve item 8.3 uh, with the uh, 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 suggestion that the chair just made. So moved. Second. Mr. Ellsworth seconds. Uh, Mr. Camaro? Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Ellsworth? Yes. Coberstein? Yes. Doring? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay, good. And then that takes us to 8.7. And the uh, staff person on that is Mr. Hausch. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item 7 before the council is a uh, contract amendment with M Group to who provides professional planning services uh, to the city and the contract amendment is for an additional $100,000 for a total contract amount not to exceed $200,000. Um, the city has a need for... Okay, uh, that's it. That's it. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. <laughs> The city has a need for limited and as needed professional planning services to assist with uh, review and processing of specific planning applications, uh, including the general plan and environmental documents required under CEQA. Uh, to satisfy this need, the city has entered into a contract with M Group, uh, previously approved uh, for up to $100,000, <coughs> and that amount was budgeted uh, into the department's budget. However, um, Essentially, the M Group has provided services beyond just uh, the day-to-day -day planning application review, but also has prepared um, a, several environmental documents, which were paid for directly by payments from developers, but uh, resulted in essentially the contract amount previously approved being uh, exceeded or not exceeded, but up to we've reached that amount. And so for our staff planner, that's a contract, um, Lily Bianco, to, in order to continue to provide services to the city, we need a contract amendment approved in order to expand that contract. Um, this is uh, her work is anticipated to cover both current development application projects, which are, as I mentioned, part of the city budget, but also to assist in the preparation or some of the work um, on some of the council directed items that have been previously discussed uh, at, at other meetings and then also are identified in the planning commission's um, tentative agenda, which was, I believe, referenced by Councilmember Koberstein earlier today. Uh, as the council is well aware, there's numerous planning applications or projects that need to be worked on, including the creation of design guidelines, the finalization of the general plan EIR, the general plan itself, et cetera. And so staff does anticipate using uh, Ms. Bianco to assist with that. Um, 
but as I mentioned, a portion of the contract that uh, was previously approved by the council has been eaten up by the preparation of environmental documents by M Group, uh, resulting in the need to increase the contract amount currently to allow Ms. Bianco to continue to serve the city. Uh, it's worth noting that those environmental documents, the payments for those have been covered through pass-through from payments from developers, so essentially no city uh, funds were used to cover the cost of those work, but it was a part of the overall contract that the city has with M Group, and therefore uh, the contract must be uh, amended in order to increase that amount, and the approval authority for that amendment relies, lies with the council. So, um, in addition, it's worth noting that any administrative fees that are passed through are, are there's an administrator, I'm sorry, any fees that are required to cover the cost of that work are also, um, the city uses an administrative fee to cover the cost of administrating that contract with M Group uh, on behalf of the developer um, or the developer's project. So with that, um, it's recommended by the Planning and Community Improvement Department that the Council approve an authorization um, to allow M Group or expand M Group's current contract for an additional $100,000 for a total contract amount not to exceed $200,000. Um, a portion of this has been previously budgeted in the current department budget, and the remainder will be uh, budgeted in the 16, sorry, 17 18 budget that's coming before the Council shortly. I'm happy to answer any questions. And Principal Heather Hines from M Group is in the audience if you have any questions for her. Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Coverstein, uh, okay. do you want to address um, your issue? Yeah, my first um, concern with this, frankly, is obligating us now to include money in the budget for next year. Um, we seem to keep throwing things into next year's budget, and we haven't gotten to our budget hearings yet. And we have a number of requests from various uh, departments to add staff or make them permanent. And I'm reluctant to put the rest of this money in to next year before we have an opportunity to look at everything else that we're being asked uh, to budget for. Aside from that, I just have a couple of questions. I, I don't quite understand what you're saying about the EIR. Are you saying, for instance, if a developer comes in and pays $40,000 for EIR work, and he pays, that goes directly to them, to M Group, that that affects what we're paying them? Is that why we don't have any money left? So how we, how we manage environmental documents is the city contracts with the preparer of the environmental document um, to ensure that it's, because it's formally the city's document, it's ultimately adopted by the city, and, but that is funded by the developer, so it's exactly right. Uh, while the developer may be paying for all the work that M Group does or any environmental planner does, uh, the money goes through the city, the city uh, adds an administrative fee, but that total amount that's paid to M Group, therefore, must be accommodated within the contract that's with M Group, and so that's what's being requested. It's exactly right. It's a pass-through payment. So using your $40,000 example, if we had the previous amount was a $100,000 approved contract, but 40000 of it went to do an EIR for a private development project, that would only leave 60000 available in the contract to do the work that we originally entered into with them. And getting to your future budget, there is no obligation to... Um, spend this money. If the council were to say, no, we don't want to approve your budget, reduce it, then the contract could be uh, ended at any time with M Group and the city. It's worth noting. So, so, so in effect, we're protected uh, uh, if we were to seek to terminate the contract, basically. It's a not to exceed amount, but it's not a guaranteed amount for M Group. That's correct. All right. What about... Uh, I guess I'm still not following this, and maybe it's the way we write our contracts. <clears throat> if we write a contract and commit to pay $100,000 to a consultant, I think that's money that's coming from us. And so it gets a little hard to figure out exactly what we're paying when we take money that we're asking developers to pay, and somehow that gets counted against our contract amount. I agree it is difficult and it's it's a challenge for staff because we don't know the next project that's going to be filed and the, the scope of that project and the scope of the environmental review to be covered by that. That's exactly right. Um, but that's why I'm asking for an additional 100000 to allow flexibility in 
whatever may come before us and also should there be the need for um, staff to rely on M group to assist with the design guidelines or um, review the EIR for the general plan before it goes out which I am planning on requesting them to do um, it provides some flexibility beyond just current development well can you tell us of the $75,000 additional amount that was appropriated last November how much of that ended up going towards EIR work I cannot give you a hard accounting of that right now um, and I don't know if Heather has she may have the numbers um, a, a significant portion did go into the not an EIR but the negative declaration done for the CIA project and this is Heather Hines principal of M group Hi. good evening mayor council members Heather Hines with the M group I don't have exact numbers but I believe the CIA um, mitigated negative declaration was somewhere around 25,000 um, which is now I believe complete so that $25,000 our contract came through our contract with the city but my understanding is it didn't actually come out of the general fund it was money that that developer paid to the city that the city then used to pay M group we've started on one additional project the a custom crush facility so that's anticipated the environmental work on that I think is somewhere around similar 2025 um, so that would be same same mechanism our contract is with the city but the money doesn't come out of the general fund it's paid to the city from the developer to provide that service so uh, to turn it around of the 75,000 that was authorized last November 50 of it has gone for planning services roughly from Lily approximately yeah and yeah. I'm not I'm not here to criticize her work or question it. I think she does nice work. I just think it's really hard to figure out where we're sitting money-wise. If we're going to amend the contract, why don't we amend it to say that these pass-through things don't, uh, don't affect our contract amount so we actually know, you know how much money we're spending on this. It's, it's a little bit confusing. If I can interject from the financial standpoint of it, according to our municipal code, uh, the city, when we do pay bills, for instance, when we receive the bills from M Group, it comes to us. We, you know, we take a look at the bill. We send everything out either usually through our AR system, our accounts receivable system, to be able to build that bill the third party plus that administrative fee. However, we are limited by our municipal code that we can only spend what's been allocated by contract and also by our budget document. So even if the bill was split to different two different ways of if they split it up you know gave us two separate bills one that's for the developer one's for us if that still falls under the realm of our contract it still has to go through our financial software which falls under our municipal code so unfortunately we can figure out a better way to, to break it down um, I track it on my side as well as M group tracks it on their side so I have a spreadsheet that says how much has gone for what specific projects because what we do as soon as we get the bill we we send a bill to that particular developer so i don't know if that can help explain a little bit of the process we do on our side and we do the same on our side so when we send our invoice to um the city we have it broken down on the number of hours and the total amount for individual projects if we are contracted to do the environmental versus the base planning work that lily does in the office and I am happy to provide an individual accounting of any contract services that we've done as a part of my budget presentation. I'm curious to know where we are on the timeline for the general plan and the EIR. So I had originally hoped to, as I mentioned to the council, hoped to be able to uh, have the EIR published for public review and comment the 45-day period this month in April. Um, however, uh, when I originally made that commitment, I was in a little bit of a different situation in that um, essentially two out of the four and a half people in my department have left and I've had to do a fair amount of kind of triage to deal with not having a building official recently and then pre not having a counter technician to take in applications for four months previously to that. So um, basically some of the other issues that were unforeseen have affected my ability to finish the EIR in-house. Uh, however, I have completed a review and update of nearly all sections I think I have six sections left uh, and I'm still pushing to try to get that uh, completed by the end of April I can't commit to that currently um, just because my workload like as I mentioned has changed significantly um, due to some of the staffing impacts but it, it is imminent so this extra money that we're um, being asked to appropriate 
Some of it will apparently be used for the Behringer EIR, but it's not going to be used for the general plan EIR, is it? Uh, no. So there's a custom crush facility that will require a CEQA document, and that's... Um, is that the Behringer? Uh, maybe it's not know. Behringer. It's not Behringer. So Behringer... Um, Whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I know it's, so it's called <laughs> Santa Lina Custom Crush. It's been on the uh, tentative agenda for the Planning Commission for a number of months. I would encourage anyone of the public interested in seeing what the Planning Commission is working on to see that document. It's attached to every agenda that the Planning Commission has and, and has been attached to that for at least the last six months. <laughs> but separate from that, um, I do anticipate utilizing M Group to assist in the final review of the draft EIR before uh, publishing it, just because that document's been uh, uh, ongoing for, I, I couldn't say how many years, but there's been a number of updates to some of the policies and criteria that are referenced in that document, and I, have while I have a fairly good handle on CEQA policy, I'd like to rely on a professional environmental planner to be able to do it one a thorough peer review prior to issuing that for the public review, especially given that there's threat of litigation on that document. I think that's very well money well spent. Um, and in addition, we do anticipate potential private development projects needing CEQA review, and M Group does quality environmental work, and they would be one of the individual firms who would be available to do that. Um, by no means is M Group the only firm that does environmental review for the city, but they are someone who I've relied on uh, in my tenure as a director because I know their work, and it's very uh, good, frankly. All right. Uh, did I open the public hearing? Uh, if I didn't, let me open the public hearing. I'll close the public hearing. Is there any further uh, council discussion? Uh, I have a, y you know, uh, the, the idea of, of, of perhaps pushing this towards the budget, uh, the, the, the people that I talk to and the people that, I, that elected me are very concerned about development here. They're very concerned about the pace of development, the pace particularly of large commercial projects. Um, and there are people, and I, and I don't disagree, that, that, as I said, we've got to stop the motor, stop the engine, and find out what's wrong because something is clicking or clinking off kilter here. Uh, the words moratorium have come up. Uh, it's come up in the county as well with residents being impacted by development that they don't really understand so that's sort of where I am too it's like if we can take the time to slow down and really understand what we are what we are developing and what Mr. Mayor, a point of order. I think we're uh, going astray and going off the agenda item and I, I'm concerned about that to a certain degree all right uh, well I, I I'm just trying to bring this up as if, if we're talking about um, funding towards development um, I'm, I'm just concerned. I'm just concerned that we're not really looking at, at, at what, what the people, the impacts that people are feeling and talking about vocally. Uh, I want to make sure that that's being heard. I think the chair at this point would entertain a motion to approve the item, if there's a motion. May I just um, add a, uh, one clarifying um, suggestion with respect to something that has nothing to do with the conversation that preceded? It is... Um, the Section 15, the Equal Employment Opportunity Provisions. Um, there's some language that I'd like to see in there, and I frankly would like to see it in all of our professional contracts. And it has to do with um, uh, gender identity, gender expression. And so um, it does not have that in here, and I think California law provides for those pr protections. So I would add uh, gender, gender identity, and gender expression as protected categories specifically and expressly in that, in that uh, category. All right. All right. At this point, the chair would invite a motion to approve uh, the item as recommended by staff with the change uh, 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 suggested by uh, Council Member Doring. Is there a so moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, Ms. Camaro? Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Koberstein? Yes. Ellsworth? Yes. Doring? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. 
Mr. Mayor, I would just um, suggest that while it's not on the agenda, that taking the direction from the council um, with respect to Council Member Doring's uh, amendment, um, that we'll we'll look into um, changing the city's template such that the city's professional services agreement would include that language as a standard part of its template. Good. Thank you. All right. That gets us through the consent calendar, uh, and that brings us to our Brings us, brings us to new business. First item is 9.1, uh, consideration of proposed approval resolution authorizing amendment unrepresented compensation resolution to duly approve and adopt publicly available pay schedules, et cetera. Uh, uh, my understanding of state law is that this is required to be uh, uh, under new business, a public hearing item. So in any event, the uh, Mr. Housh? Thank you, sir. And yeah, I'm, I apologize to the council and the public for some of the kind of jargony language in the subject line. But I do believe we may be getting off. I'm sorry. I'll take a break. Well, I did prepare a PowerPoint, but we're having some technical difficulties. I'll, I'll get going. So um, this presentation is, is uh, essentially an amendment to the current salary schedule for the building official. Um, prior to 2012, the city uh, contracted for building services solely, uh, and that included plan check, building inspections, and building official duties. And then on March 22nd of 2012, the council authorized staff to make necessary organizational and budget adjustments uh, to create a, a city staff building official position and provide a, and the goal then was to provide a substantial reduction in cost. I wasn't a part of the, the department at that point, but that was how it had, was characterized in that original presentation. This is the original pro or the project dis description of what's before the city council tonight. Uh, as mentioned, it's a resolution amending the chief building official compensation schedule. And the goal would be to make this uh, within the same classification and salary range as the assistant public works director. Uh, so again, getting back to some of the background. Um, <clears throat> In 2012, the council authorized staff to create a, a city uh, internal building official position uh, after using contract services for a number of years before that. In January of 2013, um, that position was filled. I'm sorry, January 13, that position was vacated and the city chose to reinstate contract services for part-time building official services. Then in October 13 of, of 2015, the council approved a resolution uh, reinstating the city staffed building official position and this position was filled in November of that year uh, and the building department has provided in-house building services to the public since then. Uh, in February of 2017, the building official resigned, uh, took a position with another municipality, and then at the last meeting, March 28th, staff uh, brought an item before the, the city council requesting an increase in the current um, building official salary uh, with the goal of making it more competitive recruitment. Um, and that was to make it in line with a deputy public works director. Uh, at that time, council denied the request and asked staff to expand on some of the information that was provided uh, with specific requests to explore kind of the experience of Yauntville's uh, use of contract building department staff as a means of, of comparison uh, before the council made a final decision. And so st staff has reached out to the planning director for Yauntville and has uh, got some statistics. Um, so Yauntville, which is a city of about 1.53 square miles, um, uh, a little bit, uh, about 1,000 residents less than St. Helena, depending on the statistics you look at. Uh, and um, they currently use part-time building official services three days a week. They processed uh, 92 building permits in 2016 and 17. The total value of those building permits was $6.2 million. Um, they received $50,000 in revenue. Uh, I will note this 
revenue number, I believe, is just purely their, their application fees. It does not include their uh, impact fees, so it's worth noting, and that is just an estimate. I tried to get impact fee numbers, but I wasn't able to. Uh, and the total cost for those services were $87,000. Uh, there's a breakdown of per permit cost there. And then in addition, they also contract separately with the city of Napa for code enforcement services. They get four hours a week with, from the city of Napa for $16,000. <laughs> Uh, as a comparison, St. Helena is a little bit bigger, obviously, um, about 5.3 5, 5 square miles or 03, 03 square miles. We've used full-time building services um, since I was employed with the city in May of 15. Last year, the 16-17, um, we issued 600 building permits, a uh, total of almost $20 million in valuation of the construction of those building permits. We brought in $850,000, but that does include impact fees, so it's a, it's a apples to oranges comparison with regards to revenue. Uh, and then this total cost. So the projected cost um, of the building official fully encumbered, which means salary and benefits, would be $163,549 under the current uh, salary schedule that's proposed for the before the city council. Uh, in addition, staff has budgeted $50,000 in contract building official services um, for essentially overflow plan review. So you can imagine when we were doing all in-house or all building official services in-house, there'd be occasionally the need to refer out a more complicated project or based on workloads to InterWest in the current contract or amount budgeted in the 1617 budget was $50,000. <clears throat> Prior to the building official resigning, uh, I think we had used less than $10,000 of that overall amount. However, I wanted to go to worst case scenario so the, the council could understand what the total cost would be under worst case. It would be 163 and change for fully encumbered position, including benefits, plus potentially up to $50,000 a year for outside plan check services. And that number is completely flexible. If the council is not interested in supporting that for next year's budget, we could take that off the table or drastically reduce it. But what that would work out to is a total of $213,000 for all building uh, permit services in-house. And then based on the current permit numbers, there's a breakdown of the permit per permit cost. Uh, this does include a, a significant amount of, uh, I wouldn't say significant, but a significant amount of other work, including some code enforcement. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the goal setting, we did about 20 code enforcement cases last year and were able to resolve most of them. <clears throat> um, so essentially, the, what's before the council is a, is a salary increase for the existing building official position of $20,000 uh, with the goal of making the recruitment more competitive. Um, <coughs> We've used both models in the past, and from the staff perspective, uh, the in-house model is a more, a better investment of the city funds. Um, we're able to, we have a higher workload and permit activity than other surroundings of uh, surrounding jurisdictions, um, significantly higher than Yauntville, and, and I would say even higher than Calistoga, and Calistoga just went with a in-house building official model to help them address some of their other needs. Um, other benefits of this include increased consistency, um, the contractors in the field, the architects who submit building permits, city staff uh, who work with the building official on a regular basis uh, kind of understand and know what to expect when you have in-house staff. When you use consultants, um, frankly, you could get a different person in the city every day um, because that's how they, they provide their contracts. It's just who's available, they send them up to, to meet their to fulfill their contract need, but it's not always the same person. Uh, in addition, you do have more flexibility because you can assign that individual more tasks. Um, the building official previously would assist the fire department with their fire inspections. Um, they work with citizens to address their issues. Essentially, they can be more flexible because they build relationships with folks in the city. Um, <clears throat> there's also increased accountability. Uh, when you have the same person performing the same work, uh, Basically, they've plan checked a lot of the projects that come through. Then when they drive around, they're doing the inspections. They see something that didn't come through their office or our office. They know that something was or was not done with the permit, and they have the ability to then uh, get involved and intervene as they need to. Um, in addition, prior to, prior to my tenure here at the city, um, there was a period of time when the city used contract staff for both planning and building services, and there was a lot of inappropriate uh, actions that occurred in the city. I, I'm not personally aware of them as I wasn't here, but I've been stole a lot, told a lot of anecdotal stories, and I have had to get involved in resolving some of, the, some of those issues, and this includes things as egregious as demolition of an entire structure with no building permit in hand. Um, 
Exactly. We did just have that again. Uh, and so having a building official in-house does, in staff's opinion, uh, improve the ability to do that code enforcement work and increase the accountability for folks. Uh, in, in staff's research and staff's opinion, it's essentially a similar cost as uh, the, what it would be for a contract service. I reached out to InterWest today and asked them for a, just a conceptual proposal for the overall cost. They indicated the numbers that are up on the slide, approximately $152,000 for four days a week and $181,000 for five days a week uh, for consulting building permit services. That's a building official uh, and uh, inspector trading off part-time each, so that way to keep the cost down, that's not a full-time building official. Uh, and that would likely include a little bit of code enforcement under um, the building official's watch. But based on all of that uh, and the information included in the staff report, it's recommended by the Planning and Community Improvement Department that the City Council reclassify the building official salary to a maximum of $128,000 a year or $163,000 and change total compensation uh, to be consistent with the public deputy public works director salary level, and that includes my concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. All right, uh, this is really coming back to something we had before us at the last city council meeting, where we asked um, Mr. House to follow up with more information pertaining to Yonville, as he's done here, and uh, and uh, in any event, uh, uh, is there any preliminary comment from council before I open up to public uh, comment? Is there any public comment on this item? Yes, please. I'm Anthony McKelly, 1125 Cronulla. I retired about a year and a half ago after 35 years as a contractor in St. Helena. In fact, I did the original remodel on the Carnegie Building for the city. Um, I will tell you that when you had, before Noah's time, an interim, I guess you call them interim inspectors, that only inspected two to three days a week. When we had to pour concrete, we had to wait. And that puts everybody down the road waiting. I agree that you need an in-house building inspector to especially look at all these projects that I personally know are going around town with no building permits. It's happening all the time. It happens in my neighborhood. It's happening everywhere. And if you don't have somebody in town that's out there watching that, you're losing lots of revenue. You're having projects done that are not up to code, and you're going to have, and you are having a lot of problems with that. I would just hope that whatever salary range you add up to, you at least make the developers or the people getting the building permits cover that cost to pay for that building inspector. <coughs> Don't do it for nothing. At least raise the permit fees if you have to. I mean, obviously, if you're doing 600 permits a year compared to whatever Yontville had, everybody wants to come here. So raising the fee is not going to deter them, but at least it might get the city out of the hole they're in with these financial problems you're having. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Thank you. Tracy Sweeney, 1407 Kearney. I just have a personal experience. When we did a renovation on our home, we purchased our home on Kearney Street in 2003. And at that time, this predates NOAA by quite some time. It was outsourced. You were using contract services. And we had our plan signed off on. And then as it turns out, it was incorrect. And we had to make changes afterwards. And we basically got an apology from the city. But we, it didn't matter. It was there was an outside service. They weren't familiar with the program. Came by, again, hard to con as the prior uh, speaker said, hard to get a schedule, people not showing up. And it was a really very, um, very distressful time as a citizen. So I'm speaking as a citizen, not, excuse me, not as a planning commissioner. It's not a personal anecdote. Thanks. Thank you. Any further public comment? Thank you. All right, I'll close the public hearing. I must say, from, from my perspective, uh, the planner has made the case powerfully in support of uh, his request, and I fully support it. Uh, is there any disagreement at this point from any member of the council? Yeah, this is something I would like us to um, think about and have our new city manager think about. Um, it's an area where a lot of people contract for services. And in speaking with the manager in Yonville, uh, his view when I asked him was that raising the salary wasn't really going to guarantee we'd get somebody here who would stay here. 
It seems from tonight, just coincidentally, we contract in public works. We're contracting with M, M Group. Even if we hire our own person, we're going to contract with Interwest for some things. It seems to me that we should step back and see if we can achieve some economies of cost um, and efficiency uh, by maybe moving to uh, contract services in this area generally. We're sort of parceling it out. There's also, I think, the ability for shared services with other towns uh, like Yountville. I think that the, who you get and how it works depends on the contract and how you write it. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the person who works for Yountville is there every day, like a normal staff person. Um, and I think that if I believe I heard him say that if, if they weren't satisfied with the main person who had been assigned to them, they had the ability uh, to request a change in personnel. I just see it as an opportunity for us to look at whether or not uh, we could do things differently, achieve the same level of service or, bo or more, uh, without continually having to ha have uh, more staff and more administrative burden. Okay. In talking with uh, contractors, their view is really it doesn't make a difference as far as service, whether it's a contract service or an employee. It really depends on the person. And uh, I would at least like <coughs> us to uh, give this some more thought. I mean, once we have hired someone, we've closed the door on trying to figure out if there's another way to do this. Okay. Any further council comment? Mr. Doring? Well, I, I just wanted to disclose that I, uh, the, the planner and I, planning director and I, have had a number of uh, what I would call very spirited uh, offline emails uh, where uh, I probed these issues fairly uh, vigorously, and he uh, responded fairly robustly, uh, which I appreciate because he gave me a, a lot more insight uh, with respect to the, the three issues that I think uh, dollars is, the, is a big issue, but the three issues that he uh, talked about in his emails to me that I found persuasive were this, the notion of accountability, flexibility, and consistency. That was something uh, that I did not know about as much uh, uh, as I know now. Uh, that I feel more educated on the issue. Um, I, I think there are all kinds of reasons uh, that would support a chief building official and so I'm supportive of, of, of the staff recommendation. At the same time, I think there are areas that we definitely uh, need to pursue in terms of shared services. And I would say code enforcement is one where you pull that aside and say, look, let's just focus on that. There's really a lot of opportunities in, in Napa County with Yountville and Calistoga there and in many other areas. So I see the points being made. We, we need to drive down our costs as much as possible. But there is a huge benefit uh, in my mind in terms of really, a, I call it the chain of command issues, but that's really a summary of, of the, the three points you made, accountability, flexibility, and consistency. I think that's important for us to have. I think we're not Yountville. Uh, I think Yountville has a good model, and it probably is excellent for them because I don't know if they can even keep a chief, chief building official uh, occupied full time. So that makes perfect sense for them. Uh, 92 permits a year versus 600, I, I can see that. Um, so I'm supportive of the recommendation, but I would like a, a, another discussion about how we could uh, figure out other areas where we can do shared services, in particular code enforcement. All right. Okay. Mr. White? <clears throat> um, I would love to echo <laughs> Paul. I, I truly believe that, um, like what Anthony said, uh, we really need to have a, a building official here in town. Uh, the consistency is is a huge factor, and just the familiarity and and the relationship with with uh, the townspeople, I think, uh, really makes a big difference. So, I am uh, wholeheartedly in favor of of the, the uh, staff's recommendation. Mr. Ellsworth. Yeah. Um you know, I the concept of having somebody uh, here on staff who's in town uh, makes sense. They get will get to know the community, get to have their eye, you know eyes on things. I, I think there's a lot of 
merit to that. And in talking to people the last the last week, um, the last couple of days, it 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 seems there is a lot of merit in that. However, I think the 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 idea that we're going to have a new city manager so soon, and it's it's right around the corner, and giving that or allowing that person the opportunity to be the sort of the guiding force and and who this who this person may be if this is the best way that works for them uh, I think waiting until that city manager is in place and doing what we can do to get through till then and then um, I, I guess I'll liken it to a, a, a football coach wanting to draft their own players because of the way they're trying to organize their team so I feel while there there's merit to the idea of having somebody on staff uh, I think that sh discussion should wait till the new city manager is here, so so they can be part of that decision. Ms. Coverstein, anything further? Um, I don't have anything f uh, further other than this is a department and a function that has a lot to do with community service, and I'm just looking for the best uh, community service. I. The fact that we issue six times the permits of Yountville makes me wonder, how can we be doing that? Um, are we really at the same level of service? And this may be an area where to have contract services gives you the flexibility, like you were just talking about with M Group, where you get really busy, you get more help. You, you, you want to back off, you can back off. Um, and to just have one person here, as you said, that person's going to be sending stuff out to M Group anyway. And so my preference is really, I, I think I agree with Council Member Ellsworth. I would like to leave the status quo as it is um, and bring this to our new city manager as something to... Uh, take a close look at. We may have somebody who's worked in five or ten other places and has another model, but um, I, I would prefer not to move forward on it right now. Well, I think I endorse the comments of both uh, Councilmember Doring and Vice Mayor White. I think it's very important that we move forward with this and that we move forward with it now. Uh, we have the recommendation from our planning director. This person is going to report to the planning director. We have a memo that's been signed off and approved by our interim city manager. Uh, it seems uh, it, this, is, this is, we've gone down this road before. It's worked well for us. And so I fully support the chair at this point. We'll invite a motion to accept the staff recommendation. So moved. Second. Ms. Romero. <coughs> Council Member Doring? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Ellsworth? No. Coberstein? No. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, that takes us to our next item. Uh, and uh, I, do people want to break before we get to the next item or just push on? I'm going we'll, to take a break. All right, so <laughs> we'll, 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 take a, we'll, we'll take a five minute break, which inevitably is closer to 10. Thank you very much. Congratulations.
somebody go back to Caltrans Records. I know, I heard you. So, uh... Can you please take your seats? All right. <coughs> Good late evening. Uh, this takes us to uh, item 9.2 which is consideration of proposed Greater St. Helena Property and Business Improvement District. And this is a complicated matter, and with the uh, Council's indulgence, I'm going to treat it as if it were a land use matter, meaning that the Chamber, if it wishes to speak, can have 15 minutes and then five minutes for resp response, uh, although I would hope it wouldn't take all that time. Yeah, my mics are on. Is, is that okay with the Council? Yes. May I may I uh, make an announcement, sure. Mr. Mayor? Um, I sought a, a an opinion on whether I could actually participate in this PBID discussion. I, I uh, sent the uh, the request, an extensive request, on February seventh to the FPPC. I was told that it would take no more than thirty days. I have not received to this date um, an opinion. I got uh, contact from their office on Friday saying it would take another three weeks. Um, the conflict is that I have a number of law office clients, or potential conflict, put it that way, law office clients who um, are in, whose properties are within the proposed uh, district. And so I am reluctant to uh, participate in the matter until I receive an opinion. Uh, and so I'm going to recuse myself on the issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dorian. All right, uh, let's begin with the city manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I placed this item on the agenda this evening because of the pending time deadlines that the chamber is facing. Um, we have expended uh, some staff time, and we are ex exposed to expending a lot more staff time. So it's as my recommendation for your action tonight is to give staff direction. Before we go any further at the staff level, I need uh, direction from the council to either proceed or stop or some variation of that direction. In that regard, I've asked the chamber uh, executive, um, Pam Simpson, to, to attend this evening and to share her comments, kind of a status report on, on where the chamber is with regard to the PBID. And by uh, 15 minutes worth of explanation, I think, along with the uh, staff report that's included, I think council will be in a better position to give direction to staff on where we should go next or how far we should go. So I just would ask that you call on Ms. Simpson to, to make her presentation this evening. All right. Ms. Simpson? Good 
Good evening. Uh, Pam Simpson, Sailing Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for um, putting this on the agenda tonight. So there's another opportunity for people to hear about the proposed PBID. Um, really, we're in a situation now where we're trying to take the petition out to property owners. And so we're in a, in a spot where um, it's, it's time to find out if the PBID is something that property owners would like to sign up for. Um, and so therefore, we're, um, we're at a spot, I think it's, it looked like city council needed to look at the MDP and, um, and determine whether it was within the, um, the within the, the jurisdiction of the of the Saint, of the of the laws of, of Saint Helena and fit and conformed before we were um, going to go out to uh, the property owners. But tonight we were actually looking just to answer your questions about the MDP. Um, we were planning on doing a formal presentation about the entire district once we had. Um, support and um, could show you um, more support from the property owners. So, um, if I can address just a couple things in the in the um, city attorney or the staff report that the city attorney looked uh, read through, um, one of the things that was being requested tonight was a resolution um, to uh, ask the county to include county properties in this district, and um, we wanted to um, sort of speak to that. The this um, requirement or this this um, ask of the city um, to or ask of the county to give consent for the properties is not uh, legally uh, required. It's a resolution that is sort of a common, common courtesy to the county. And it's usually done once the PBID has shown, again, some support for the PBID, and which means we've actually put the petitions out and we've actually gotten some support, which we haven't done yet. So we're uh, respectfully asking you not to vote on that resolution tonight, that that resolution would be postponed until the May um, council meeting when we can come to you and actually show you that there is some support. If you voted on a resolution tonight, you're either, you're, in our opinion, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're basically saying that you're, if you vote yes, you're voting. You're, you're saying that in theory you like the idea of the PBID. You think that this is a good idea, and that might give the wrong impression to to some of the property owners. And, and conversely, the same way. If you vote no on this, you might again be giving property owners some indication that you that you're not supportive of the PBID. So we would hope. Um, you know, it looked like most of the information in this in the staff report was accurate. I did bring Civitas advisors here tonight, who we've been working with for the last year on the PBID. I think that they would like to address a couple things in the staff report. But um, the, the main thing I wanted to bring across was the resolution and um, possibly not taking that up tonight. Um, and also, you know, we're here to answer questions. We're here if you've got uh, particular questions about the, the city's properties, um, their assessment, and uh, if you've got questions about how the, anything was formed. But at this point, we're still in that preliminary phase, and we're just at the point where we're ready to take it out and find out if there is property owner support for it. All right, good. Did you, did you guys want to address anything in the city in the in the report? Okay. All right. Uh, and then let we me, can come back and clarify if there's any questions. All right. Well, let me let me open it up for public comment, and I'm sure we're going to have some questions of you uh, in a, in a few minutes. Any any public comment? I have so many questions about this. Um, I I got a I took a look at the area that's going to be included in this um, business district, and and quite frankly, it looks like a gerrymandered voting area from some other state. I don't understand why. A couple of us came from the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> that's where Governor Jerry. Uh, um, Came from, uh, but but I'm just I just looked at the at the the detail for the area that's around where my home is, and I see private residences in zone one, and I see um, one of my neighbors in zone four, and the entire um, length of Pope Street is part of this, and I I don't understand why that's included in um, in a business district. Um, 
or a proposed business district and why those properties are going to be assessed um, and beautified. I don't know what beautification is warranted there. And I'm um, particularly um, concerned about the amount of, of money um, that's going to be collected through this process that's going to be spent on marketing. And I don't see, it, it, and marketing is considered one of the benefits of, of um, being in this district and being, um, getting this assessment on the property. And yet I don't see any, any mitigation for any of the impacts. I mean, I'm assuming marketing is going to be bringing even more people um, to St. Helena, and more people means more impacts on city um, infrastructure and city services, and yet I, I didn't see anything in here that was going to address that. So I, d I just have a lot of questions about this whole process, and um, and I, I'm a little upset that it's kind of being pushed through to meet um, to meet the chamber's deadline when it seems like it really does warrant um, a lot more um, consideration and thought. I'm also concerned about those areas um, that are um, zone three, which I guess are the areas that are in the county, and why those are being pulled into the business district, because in looking at the overlays, it looks like those are a lot of, um, there's a lot of oak woodland in there, and, um, and watershed, and um, I just would, I personally would prefer to see um, the brakes put on some of that kind of development. Okay, good. Thank you. Any further public comment? Uh, my name is Bobby Monette, and I'm speaking as a um, citizen. And um, I did go to one of the workshops, but I must say this is complicated, so I'm not, I don't pretend to totally understand um, all about it, but these are still some of the concerns I have. I'm open to learn more. But it seems to me that the system is based on a business model in this sense, that those with the most investment have the most votes. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, you know, which is fine. I think that's fine. It works in, in corporations and it works in business. Um, and again, I, I echo what was ju the other speaker just said, um, that, um, that um, disbursement of funds um, that without public input and benefits um, and not the impacts um, gu guiding these decisions is something that really bothers me because if, these, if there were no public funds, it would just, you know, the business model would seem to me to be totally appropriate. But since there would be public funds, um, that aspect of the model is really in conflict with, with um, governance. Um, I think that the impacts have to be determined by an objective body, by an objective party. Um, not by people who have a conflict of interest in the benefits. The benefits and impacts can't be looked at and determined by the same people, it seems to me, when you're using f public funds. Um, and if, um, so, yes, yeah, so I already said, if, if any pubs are being involved, I think this model is inappropriate. <laughs> if there's any taxpayer money involved, it must be collected and dispersed in a way that is transparent to the public, open to public comment at every stage, and uh, my understanding is that the public would not be involved in, in any of the stages and with appropriate oversight from independent parties who could actually look at the impacts with, um, you know, without any investment in the outcome. So to my mind, it seems antithetical to allow any public monies in this, in this plan seems antithetical to the fiduciary duty of the city council because it will be allowing public funds to be used in a way that will not involve um, all the, you know, all the checks and balances that are usually applied to the use of taxpayers' money. Thank you very much. Uh, any further public comment? Uh, good evening, uh, Rich Schertz, uh, 1600 Dean York Lane. Um, is my letter to the city manager of March 20th in the packet? Do you all have that? I didn't. I don't think so. I delivered it to City Hall also Monday morning. Well, 
Anyway, if you're at all familiar with the proposal, they've got four districts, uh, one, two, three, four. Um, they've set out benefits, uh, marketing, m money f primarily for the chamber for marketing, business development, and um, to me, those benefits apply in all districts pretty much the same level. But we've got a rate schedule, which if you're not familiar with this, the rate schedule for District 1, which is the downtown area, is 50 times higher than the rate schedule for the Blue Zone or District 2, 200 times higher than the rate schedule for District 3. So it seems to me if um, California law requires specific benefits equitably apportioned to all property owners, uh, maybe Pam can come up and explain what equitable means to her, because it's a, it's a mystery how they even floated this thing. And one final thing, in the handouts, we were all told that the if this passes, chamber dues will be eliminated. So now you've got chamber members benefiting from this, and in some cases, their chamber dues are more than the assessment, so they actually get a net credit. So maybe Pam could respond. Okay. I'm Matthew McKell again. I, I'm only one interest in the buildings we have in town, so I want to make it clear I'm only speaking for myself, not my other family members, number one. We're puzzled because the ice cream store on Oak Street has a higher assessment than our building on Main Street. Like Rich was saying, we don't understand why that building has to pay more when it's not even on the main street. And I understand when I went to the workshop, it's because of the size of the building. And granted, the building on Oak Street is a little larger, but it only has professional services there other than the ice cream store and the hairdresser, where the building on Main Street is definitely a building. <coughs> However, this all has come about uh, to us in the family, because I've talked to my cousin, that the businesses are being required to pay for all the sins of the city for the last 50 years. I was alive when the city came to my father and uncle to plant the trees downtown. And when they did that, they said, if we, and Mayor Aqua was the mayor then, that if we allowed uh, the businesses to put in these trees, we'll take care of them. City, a year later, said, no, 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 that's your responsibility now. And that wasn't right. And now those trees have backed up our sewer twice. And I know this improvement district that they want to do is supposedly going to clean up town. I've seen all the drawings. But it's not going to make our business any better. Not with the $800 that the city now is charging us for our two businesses to operate because of the sewer rate. Now you're going to put another $2,000 on one building, 15 on the other. Does the chamber think that we as landlords are just going to absor keep absorbing these costs and not pass it on in our lease agreements? I mean, the tenants are the ones that are going to bear the burden in the end. And then they're going to leave town. And then, I don't know, we'll end up at the Gap or somebody else in town because they're going to be the only ones that can afford to be in business here. And a question I had to Pam was that, okay, today they want $700,000, but it doesn't mean that next year or three years down the road we want a million dollars. So we're going to raise your assessment and we won't get to vote on it again unless I was mistaken when I went to that meeting, and she can clarify that. Because there is no sunset, there is no max cost they're going to do to us, and we've gone to the chamber, and I don't mean to pick on Pam, but the side business is off Main Street, nobody knows we're there. And the ch nobody has helped us or any of the other buildings say there's businesses on Oak Street on Railroad Avenue. And now we just got to give you money from those businesses on Oak Street that you wouldn't help us with? I mean, for me, I know I'm voting no, and I get to be part of two buildings, but that's my opinion. Okay, good. Okay. Any further public comment? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'm Mike Malott, 1091 St. Helena Highway South, St. Helena. Uh, I've been a resident of St. Helena area for 68 years. We have property outside of the city of St. Helena that we are in this assessment district now. It's $2,000 a year, which isn't the end of the world, but we have a lot of other fees that we're paying. But anyway, the Chamber of Commerce to me and everyone that I've talked to in the city almost is a chamber is by the business people of the city, not the property owners. The property owners don't know what, the, how the businesses are running. Sure, if you're the property owner and the business owner, it's different. You're paying one fee or the other. But for us, out in the city, out of the city, we we will get no benefit from this. It's it, if it's a, a a chamber thing, a chamber should be in the city limits. I went to one of the meetings and was given a lot of information, and some of the information wasn't correct. I was told that if a no, if you a person didn't send in their ballot, it was considered a no vote. That isn't the case. The ballots will be con will be fifty percent plus one of, of to get an approval of the ballots that are received. So if you don't send in your ballot, you're not going to get included in there. But anyway, a chamber should be by the businesses, not by the business, business owner, or the property owners. Thank you. All right. Any further uh, public comment? All right, let me close the public comment and invite Ms. Simpson back, uh, or the consultant back. I hope you have a good list. I know it. <laughs> I know it started with uh, Governor Jerry uh, yes. of Massachusetts. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Melanie Cottrell with Civitas. We are here tonight to listen to you, so thank you all for your comments. We hear you, and I've been writing down your questions, and I hope I have some answers tonight that will bring clarity for you. My role tonight is to talk more about the procedural, technical, legal, what we can and can't do aspects. And then Pam will talk a little bit more <coughs> about specifically the marketing programs, the boundaries, St. Helena in particular. You started off with a comment about residential and some of the agricultural vineyard properties. Under this law, if a property is purely residential or purely agricultural, we cannot assess it. It is not included in the assessment. I understand that it's a little confusing because it's on the map. We do that so that the boundaries are contiguous. However, I have the plan right here, and agriculture and residential parcels are not paying the assessment. We actually had the city attorney's office go through it really carefully with us to make sure that that was the case. I also wanted to make it clear that the deadline for the formation comes from the county assessor's office. Because this would go on the property tax bill, the county assessor has a deadline to put items on that tax bill. That's where our deadline comes from. The idea that the funding is just given to the chamber to do whatever also came up, this is actually a very open process. The corporation that manages these funds is subject to the Brown Act. The Brown Act is the law that says the city council has to let us all be here and let us all speak. So the corporation that manages these funds will have to do the exact same thing. Their agendas will be posted 72 hours in advance. Any member of the public can come to the meeting. Any member of the public can speak on an agenda item, just like coming to a city council meeting. In addition, all of the financials, the plans, the documents, the contracts, once the PBIT is formed, all of that is public record, just like city documents. So at any time, anyone paying the assessment or not can request those records and get a copy of them. The idea also that this is public slash private, it gets a little confusing. We think of this as a public-private partnership because you're right in that the city would be paying the assessment. The city is a property owner. That is completely normal. And it really what we like to see is the city working together with the property owners that are commercial property owners to make something happen. We have proposed this district for a five-year term. It does sunset right. five years. That's it. After about four years, you would see Pam or 
and the chamber, come back and start this whole process over again. The process has two voting components to it. First, what we're looking to do now is start a petition process. And it's very much like what you see on the November ballot. When you go to the grocery store and there's the guy outside the grocery store holding a petition asking you to sign it, that's about what we're going to do. We're here tonight to hear comments on the plan that that petition is based on. So we'll go to petition. We have to get the petition signed by owners that will pay 50%, over 50%. And that's where that not voting is kind of a no vote comes into play. That's the first process is the petition. We have a second process that we only get to if we meet our petition goal. And really, like I said, what we're looking to do here is to go out to the petition process to talk to owners to see if we can get enough petitions signed. If we can't get those petitions, that's it. This is over. It doesn't go anywhere. <coughs> if we get the petition signed, then we come back to council for another hearing. Council adopts a resolution saying we intend to form this district. That kicks off a ballot process. Then all of the owners are mailed ballots. The ballots are a yes or no, just like your regular ballot. We come back, we count the ballots. If then of the ballots returned are in favor, then the council has the ability to actually form the district. So we have really a two-step voting process, a petition and a ballot, really designed to make sure that the owners have a lot of say in this process. Is the ballot process one man, one vote? No, it's weighted. It's Both weighted. processes are weighted. Both processes are weighted, okay. One, one person, one vote. One person, one vote, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> In keeping with assessment law, it is one dollar equals one vote. All right. Yep. <laughs> also, there is no ability to raise the assessment beyond 3% every year during the five-year term. So it's a five-year term. It may go up 3% every year. That doesn't mean it will, but it can. And the management plan that we're going to be circulating after we get any comments tonight says the maximum annual rates in there. We cannot go beyond those rates without coming back to council, doing more hearings, going out to the property owners again. So we do have a five-year term with a maximum amount that each owner would pay. Okay, good. Yeah. That's the technical piece. And Pam, did you want to talk about St. Helena and your programs? Thank you. So, um, you know, a couple of cl clarifications. You know, everybody keeps talking about how the, the chamber's doing this. And I want to really, um, you know, kind of back up and start with uh, the fact that we had property owners come to us. And they came to us about a year ago when we saw the financial situation and who, um, you know, who said, is there, is there a way that we can help? Is there something we can do? Also came out of the ad hoc um, uh, revenue task force where we were looking at different options. Sales tax was the first step, but what, what else could happen? And we started looking at, you know, what, what, could, what could we do to increase revenue or in, in at least get improvements done in this town. It really came down to, you know, um, an economic development plan or some sort of economic development tool. Uh, PBIT is a tool. It is a tool that we can use, many of jurisdictions have, um, that allows us to get stable funding for some of the things that, that the property owners have wanted for a long time in this area, including, you know, um, better downtown and beautification and a little more recognition for those county properties who are in the district whose economies are affected by what happens in St. Helena. So, you know, just to clarify again, it wasn't the chamber uh, on our own just thinking that this is a great idea. This really did come from a collaboration of, of um, property owners who've also invested with the chamber in, in starting this process. And like Melanie says, tonight we're trying to get a comments. This is, this is um, you know, we're trying to go out and find out what pro property owners think about that. We did several um, open houses where people did come. We didn't get a great showing, but we did get lots of people come and ask questions. I've taken a lot of phone calls. I've gone out personally and talked to a lot of people. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't be putting this out there if we didn't feel like we had some real need in this town for something like uh, an improvement district, and if we didn't feel like we had some support. And of course, this is not going to be easy, but this is going to be an in, uh, 
a, a great process of explaining to people what we could do. Um, again, there's three services that would be provided. It's going to be uh, beautification and maintenance for a lot of it for downtown, but some of it in the outline areas as well. Marketing, um, um, you know, Mr. Morales, uh, or Mr. Um, uh, Malat's uh, tenant is Delectus Wine. You know, they need marketing and they benefit from the marketing that we do. And um, and uh, as do a lot of the, uh, the the businesses that are in the, the county areas, and so when we market St. Helena, they do benefit from the marketing that we do. And the marketing doesn't see city lines; they don't see city limits. Visitors who come here don't know if they're at Dina Deluca, whether they're in the city of St. Helena or whether they're not. We are all in this together. This is a county thing, and this is a greater St. Helena thing. We also had property owners who came to us and said. Um, what can we do to help? These are property owners who are not in the city limits. These were property owners who felt like their businesses could be hurt should something happen with the city of St. Helena's financial situation. And so they, who long felt that they were part of the St. Helena family, and long felt that they were part of contributing to the St. Helena economy. So this is the reason that we went beyond the city of St. Helena lines, because it's very hard when you're doing marketing for this entire area not to include um, all of those those folks. So that's uh, sort of a background on why we, we formed the district the way we did. Um, and a little bit about some of the, the 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 programs that we intend to do. A lot of the one of the third ones that I said was business development. A lot of that, um, you know, I see what could happen with business development is a lot of business attraction. It's something we haven't had in this town. Something we've talked long about. How do we attract businesses? How do we help um, the the 1351 get the right tenant in there? Um, this is something that we talked about during the uh, during the ad hoc revenue tax force during the campaign. What what does Main Street map downtown look like? What should it look like? The PBIT is an opportunity for those kind of conversations to happen. If we thought that the city of St. Helena was going to have revenue to put an economic development department in place, you know, that uh, that would be an option. We don't see that happening in the next five years. This is this is something that we can do now. It's a tool we're offering, and it's um, it's something that's worked in other communities. And so we'd like to take it out to the property owners and explain what it is we're trying to do and see if we can gather enough support to see this thing come to fruition. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Any further public comment? Well, let me... We typically only allow once, uh, Mr. Schertz, but go ahead. We'll waive that. Uh, I didn't hear a response to my question regarding the vast differences in the rate schedule. 19 cents, almost 20 cents a square foot in the red zone one, four tenths of one cent in zone two, and one one hundredth of a cent in zone three. All right, let's see whether we can get a response. Fair enough. When we design these districts, one thing that we do is we look at the concentration of businesses and the concentration of services. And we look at where we're going to be doing the most frequent, intensive efforts, and where else could still benefit but not need as frequent and intensive services. So what we did when we were designing the various zones was really look at the concentration of businesses. And you can see even in the size of the pieces of land where we have a lot of businesses, we tend to have smaller parcels. As we move out of that smaller core, we see businesses that are a little more spread out, parcels that are a lot bigger. We start to see the vineyards interspersed. So what we did in designing this was try to really relate the assessment back to the benefit as we have to do by law, taking into consideration how those various kinds of parcels will be served by the PBID. So in the zones that are paying the most, the services are very concentrated and they will be getting the most service. There are some services that will only happen in the higher paying zones. They will not happen in the exterior zones because there are things like infrastructure that are very location specific. So we tied that to the location and the outer parcels don't pay as much per square foot because they don't receive the same benefit as those parcels that are really close to where those infrastructure improvements will be. And that is something that is required by the law. 
This is a plan that we have actually had an engineering firm also review and sign off on, as well as the city attorney's office. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, any further public comment? All right, uh, let me uh, close the public comment. You can take a seat. You may have to get back up and, in terms of responding to council questions at the moment, but uh, let me invite uh, some council comment. Uh, the Vice Mayor? <clears throat> Well, as far as the resolution is concerned, I would like to continue it until after the petition is is uh, circulated. Um, I mean, if there's no no support from the businesses outside the city limits, then I see no reason to go ask the county for for permission or for <coughs> consent or whatever it is that, that we're asking them. Um, I don't have any questions of of uh, either Pam or the consultant. Um, I've read through it, and I think I pretty much understand uh, the mechanisms and stuff. And and uh, I can wait until after we see how much support there is uh, to make any decisions. All right, and uh, Ms. just on the issue of that resolution, um, it it doesn't. It's not clear to me how we can stick with the timetable that is set out in this report if um, we go to Napa County in May uh, to talk about whether or not we can <coughs> tax their property. Could you address that? Maybe, Tom? Well, I, there are separate issues, I think. The timetable is one. Um, there is no legal requirement that you um, pass that resolution this evening. Right. You, you will have to pass that resolution, or the plan will have to be changed, one or the other. Um, in other words, the, the Streets and Highway Code in the PBID law requires you to, to ask the county for its approval at some point. Um, and they have to give it. And they have to give it for this plan to go forward. If that, in the absence of that approval, this plan will have to be revised. So, but but um, legally, you don't have to do it this evening. You could wait. But it is, there is a little bit of a, um, I want to say chicken egg issue there or a brinksmanship or something, but it's certainly doable uh -huh. um, that they, that, that we could um, we could uh, follow the schedule that the the chamber is proposing. All right. In other words, it doesn't have to be done this evening under the PBID law. All right. Yes. Go ahead. Just to add to that, procedurally, what standard practice is is we do the petitions. We come back to council with two resolutions: the consent resolution that's on tonight and the resolution of intention. Those are typically done together. And that gives us a minimum 45 day window to go to the county and have them adopt that resolution. Jane in my office has already been talking to the county and they have expressed that they are generally supportive. So we'd like to take that resolution to them once we know that the city is moving forward and we have petitions in hand. All right. Uh as you think about the timeline at the last uh, city council meeting, uh, we talked about uh, canceling the meeting on July 27th, so keep that in mind. Uh, I will not be here uh, uh, on that date. All right. Uh, Ms. Coverstein, yeah. Yeah, at the, at the risk of speaking longer than Council Member Ellsworth before, um, I, I just want to get my views on this issue out on the table. Our manager has asked us what our sense is and how much more time the staff uh, should spend on this. Uh, I do want to thank Pam <clears throat> and Marcus. Uh, they met with me in January and then again uh, after that when I had some questions about the map and, and other things. Um, but after giving this a lot of thought, um, I think we should stop the process now, actually. Uh, just so the public understands, uh, what we're being asked to do here as a city is pay initially about $93,000 a year in assessments, which can go up 3% a year, and then also to possibly have to plug the gap um, of benefits as identified in the report uh, from our council that might be uh, general benefits as opposed to specific benefits. And for the city, 
you take that amount and then you increase it by 3% every year, that's about $835,000 over five years. I think, you know, we're kind of acting like spendthrifts here. Every time we turn around, there's another $100,000 hit or more uh, on the general fund. And in this case, what used to be uh, an annual request from the chamber for money for a project or a couple projects, it's now kind of morphed its way into a uh, five-year, more or less, contractual commitment. And I, I'm bothered when we uh, tackle some of these financial issues incrementally. Um, and in this case, I feel that we would be taking a step, uh, committing ourselves uh, to put out all this money, and we, don't, we still don't know the strength of our own financial foundation here. We're going to hear about the, uh, whatever that analysis is, I'm forgetting the word, uh, the financial one. Right. And it'll be next meeting when we'll see our um, financials from the last year. And we even ha haven't even had a chance at this point um, to take a measure of how much money we're getting from Measure D. You know, it ha it's barely trickling in. And we don't know how much money is really going to come out of the Los Angeles, not Los Angeles, Los Alcabas. <laughs> maybe <laughs> Las Alcabas uh, Hotel. So, um, you know, while this might give some certainty to the chamber about how they can operate for the next uh, five years, I'm not ready right now to box the city uh, into this commitment. I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, who knows what needs are going to come in front of us uh, next year that might be important uh, or need our attention. And we will have put this five-year city commitment in place. You know, we have other groups here. Rianda House, Up Valley Center. I mean, other people might come to us and uh, need funds for various purposes. And here we have already earmarked a lot of our funds for something else. And I, I think we need to retain our flexibility. Uh, I think one of my biggest objections to this is I just have a, a fundamental ish, uh, problem with handing over economic development to a PBID district. Uh, this economic development is a significant part of this uh, whole plan. It's about one hundred and seventy to one hundred and ninety thousand dollars a year, and this is just my personal view. Uh, I said this a lot during the campaign. I think economic development is a city function. I don't think it's a chamber function. And I think this is an area where this city needs to step up and get proactive, not dish money off to somebody else to figure out how we're going to get people in our empty stores or what we're going to do about our downtown or anything else for that matter. And we have a lot of things on our plate right now that dovetail right into economic development. We still are talking about revenue generation. We have to look at the RFPs. We haven't analyzed hotels. You know, we're going to have revisions coming to our zoning ordinance uh, that could impact uh, and incentivize development. And so I think it makes sense to hold that economic development piece in the city. And that instead of us spending $150,000 a year on PBID money, we start to put it on things where we directly are making decisions and trying to make something happen. And I'm not anti-business here. I'm not anti-chamber. I just think that we'll be most effective <laughs> if the city takes the lead, if the city creates an economic development plan and puts city funds behind it. I think we should be working with our downtown business owners, our property owners, our residents, other stakeholders. We should have some money so that we could investigate for ourselves what are the strengths of our downtown, what are the weaknesses, you know, what are our opportunities, what can we do? We need to understand business and service uh, businesses in this day and age 
and in small towns. And whatever the good intentions of the chamber might be here to do economic development, I really think it's the city that has the power and actually has the authority to make that happen. It, we are the ones who can figure out what barricades we are putting up or have put up that are keeping business uh, from coming here. And I don't think we need to farm that out. I think we need to do it ourselves. We're the ones who can figure out how to deliver fast track permitting. We should be creating the development incentives, whether they're financial or they're based in our zoning ordinance or whatever. I don't think we need to get economic development as a special benefit out of a taxing district, you know, pay $150,000 to get it. I think we need to be uh, proactive. We need to use those city funds ourselves and get to work on a solution. I had some issues with this map, and um, I don't want to go into them in detail, but I think people should understand what the tax is that the city is being paid. I mean, our, our, uh, I believe our corporate yard is in here on Charter Oak. A couple of vacant pieces of property that we own <clears throat> along out towards the Silverado Trail. I think our park on Pope Street is still in here. The teen center, the Carnegie Building. These are all city assets uh, that need our attention and our money. And instead of turning over assessment dollars for somebody else to do it, I think we need to position ourselves to uh, address the condition of the corporate yard, allocate more funding you know, to the parks division in our public works department so that they can maintain and improve our parks and we can direct that activity. I think we need to fund, use some of this money to fund the preparation of plans and conduct studies to determine what our options are for our city assets and get to work and get something done. I, I can't justify paying $49,000 a year assessment on Adams. It's vacant. Half of it is owned ag. It just it doesn't make a lot of sense. You add the library to that at nearly $8,000 a year, well, that probably would have covered the upholstery that the library director asked us for just last week. And my point is, we should take this money ourselves and do something with it instead of handing it off uh, for supposed special benefits that, frankly, I, I just don't see. Okay. I also think, I told you it was going to be a while. <laughs> uh, this is a business tax. It impacts virtually every business property in this town and also outside of this town. You know, by adopting um, Measure D, we put in place just one of the recommendations of our res revenue task force, and they made a lot of res recommendations. And if we determine for good reason that we need to put in place another tax ourselves mm -hmm. to support the general welfare of the t entire city, I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these same people coming in here and saying, you're already taxing us. How many more times are you going to tax us? And I wouldn't blame them for doing it. And I really feel that we need to reserve that power to ourselves for things that are general need of the whole community, and we have an open hearing about it and decide if we're going to proceed. After hearing about the water rates tonight, I have real concerns about the financial burden uh, of this on uh, our small businesses. Uh, I do feel it's going to be passed through to many of them. And can they afford to stay in business if we pile another 100 or $200 a month on them through uh, assessments? Based on what I heard tonight, I, I think, you know, they're barely going to make it. They're going to barely be above water, or they'll be below water with these water rates. And lastly, I, I firmly believe that chamber marketing and administrative costs should be supported by the membership dues. And the other grants, corporate sponsorships, what are, wherever they can uh, raise money, uh, you know, they d there was an indication in the report that they had other sources. I don't think that we need to create a public tax structure to support marketing and chamber administration. 
So when you take that economic development piece out of this pro out of this program, you still have marketing, you still have administration, and then you have maintenance and infrastructure. And I'm I'm not making light of maintenance and infrastructure, but the fact is we're kind of I think just on the edge of getting a fairly substantial grant to uh, do something for our sidewalks downtown, uh, which will go a long way to doing things. And frankly, that's something that this PBID can't do. The PBID cannot step in and do something that's a normal government function. You can supplement it, but you can't do it. I, I would say, let's stick with the current model or the old model, and if there are infrastructure or maintenance or beautification projects that the chamber or anybody else wants to bring to the council. Bring them to us one at a time or bring them to us at our budget session and we can decide on them and award money to do them. I'm not opposed to us allocating funds for those purposes. What I am opposed to is throwing this money in a pot and losing our own ability to do some really important uh, work here. So, if you, my view here is that I, I can't support this. I wouldn't urge this city to move forward at all beyond where we are now. Uh, if a resolution comes back, um, you know, to bring, to engage the county, I, I won't support that either. I don't support including all this city property in this district. A lot of it just doesn't make sense. It takes more money from the city that we could be using for something else. And I don't support spending any more city staff time or any more of our financial resources working on this. Uh, we need to get to work on the budget. We need to finish the rate study again, which has just happened. We need to hire a new city manager. We need to adopt the general plan. We need to position ourselves to respond to the RFPs in an intelligent manner. We have to undertake a comprehensive review of our zoning regulations. We need to get moving on economic development. And we have to tackle uh, preparation of a plan to start to address the full range of our housing reasons, our housing needs. And so um, my mind's not gonna change a month from now. Uh, I, I just think that we should not proceed with this at all. That's it. Okay, Mr. Ellsworth. Um, so my thoughts on this, um, <clears throat> when, when I was, uh, I met with Pam and Marcus a number of months ago, and on paper, the, the idea of a P-bid or a, a tourist improvement district uh, in some areas may work. I have visited Recently, I went to India, where there was a uh, an area uh, that that it seemed to be a really it seemed to really work there uh, because it was a commercial area with access to the freeway. It wasn't in a residential area, and it was in a town that that um, that uh, had a commercial district that had gone gone down, but it wasn't near any residences, and so it made sense there. What what my my worry here is that there's there's no discussion of impacts to the other people who will be impacted by this decision who are the residents. We have a unique situation here where our thoroughfare is a, we share it. Our businesses share it with our commercial use. So we're all in the same boat. And yet the residents won't be voting on this. So I have a problem with that where those who will be impacted um, won't have a vote. In the, in the county, they created a, a, a um, TID based on hotel tax, um, and it, it's stipulated that none of the money, none of the $6 million can go to analyzing impacts or addressing impacts. And I was at a meeting where I said, it's as if you, the marketing aspect, you're inviting the whole world to a party you know that lamps and chairs are going to be broken, but there's no, no stipulation for 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 who's who's going to pay for it. Um, so the absence of, of a discussion of impacts in here, I think, is a it's it's incomplete. 
and, and one of the things we, we continue talking about is having a, an overall cost-benefit analysis for the impacts of tourism. So if we know that our 5,000 residents are not causing the, the most impact here, but rather it's the millions of visitors. So how, do, how does that get addressed? And I, I don't see it here, and that concerns me. Um, the fact that it's not voted on by all the people who will be impacted. Um, if city parcels are included, that means that, that citizen resident tax dollars are going to this, but they don't have a vote. And to me, that's concerning. Um, also the idea that it may be determined that another tax for the city, whether it be a, a, a parcel tax or a, a, a transfer tax or some kind of business tax, I think if this was in place, that, that would end that discussion. And I think that needs to be, all those need to be on the table, particularly when we have a new city manager here. Um, this is five years. That's a long time if it doesn't work. Um, so, and I had one, 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 one more point here. Um, so, so in, on page 125, number four, it says, an opportunity to establish private sector management and accountability. A nonprofit private organization formed for the sole purpose of improving Greater St. Helena will manage the services provided and the, the, uh, what, uh, the letters there. But, <laughs> yeah, so the, the point is that we're intermixed here. The, the residents and the commercial areas intermixed. So maybe this <coughs> makes sense if it's a, just a business district somewhere with its own access, but this is privatizing our shared area. This is having a private corporation managing our shared area, and it doesn't, to me, it doesn't um, uh, allow for the kind of uh, 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 democratic overall process that, that a, a town like ours uh, needs. So I, I unfortunately can't support it. I appreciate the effort to try to, to come up with an idea to uh, help our, our business district, and I'm, all, I'm supportive of continued discussion of that. But this, to me, uh, doesn't address the impacts to our, to our community. So I, 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 I can't, can't support this. Well, uh, <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, I thought uh, Councilmember Coberstein made some good points. I don't necessarily accept many of them, uh, particularly with respect to economic development. Uh, uh, I think uh, Ms. Simpson's absolutely right that uh, uh, we've talked about this ever since I've been in city government, and the city's not been able to muster the resources to engage in the type of proactive uh, economic development that uh, we should have. I wish the city could do it. I would agree with her that it's a better way to go about it, but I don't see it happening. Uh, 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 inside city government uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, I just don't. Uh, and uh, I must say that also uh, uh, the PBID, uh, if I, the PBID, if I recall correctly, was something that was and is supported in the general plan uh, that's pending before the city. And so to my way of thinking, uh, uh, I agree with the vice mayor that, uh, that uh, this should go uh, forward and see whether uh, the property owners do or do not embrace it. We'll find out. It may well be from what we've heard tonight that it's going to be very hard to, to mobilize uh, a sufficient number of weighted property interest uh, to move forward. As for the city budget, my understanding, but maybe it's wrong, is that, uh, is that yes, uh, there is significant assessment on the city, but at the same time, uh, down the road, the city would not be renewing its contract with the chamber, which is about two hundred thousand dollars a year. So there's there's a significant offset uh, there, uh, and uh, and and with respect to the general benefit, uh, uh, I did not appreciate before this evening uh, that uh, the city could be contingently liable. Or before I read the report, that the city could be contingently liable for that uh, general benefit, but at the same time, the chamber is asserting that one way or the other it would expect most of the uh, general benefit to be funded out of grants, corporate sponsorships, event income, and so on. So hopefully that would happen and minimize the contingent liability of the city. At least my position for this evening is that I would, uh, uh, I would vote to have the staff uh, move forward with it, but it sounds like it's going to be 2-2 and, and uh, absent uh, 
a majority. I don't see how the staff can proceed with it uh, unless and until we get Mr. Doring back uh, uh, through FPPC clearance and then uh, see how he would vote with respect to it. Uh, the the uh, unfortunate side of that is that I think it's just going to blow the uh, timeline that uh, that, uh, that, uh, that 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 the proposers for the PPID uh, wish, but unfortunately that's where we are. So unless anybody disagrees with that, I think there's no staff direction tonight with well, respect to Well, I mean, to a procedurally, do we, I, I don't know if you want to have more discussion or not, but procedurally, do we vote on what we were asked to vote on and then we have a recorded vote and then when, when and if Mr. Doring does come back, then it is proper to make well, a motion to reconsider? Well, I, I don't think it's, the way I read the rules, uh, reconsideration uh, would be made by someone that was in the majority at the meeting uh, where it occurred. So if it comes back, it really comes back as a new matter uh, that would uh, uh, require a, a vote at that point in time. But what I'm understanding is that the, um, uh, is that the sponsors uh, are not seeking a vote on in terms of a county resolution tonight, so that's not necessary. Right, but uh, our, you know, our manager has asked us to give him direction. But the that's exactly yeah. right. He's asked to give us direction. And what I'm saying and what I thought I said was that we're not uh, able to, or, or there, the city council tonight cannot provide direction because uh, from what I hear, it's going to be a 2-2 vote. That is not enough to provide direction. Uh, and uh, we're not going to know where we are until, unless and until Mr. Doring receives clearance. Uh, uh, and if he doesn't receive clearance, then there will be no direction. Is that... You Maybe can't I mean, fault my time in putting this on the agenda, seeking direction from the council. Then. Right. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But I think I think that's where we are. Uh, if we can add some procedural clarity, no, could we? No, no, I think we. I think we've. Um, I think we're we're through with the public discussion at this point. Thank you very much. Tom, did you have something? No. It. Um, it would be appropriate for the council if it's your desire. You certainly don't have to, to take a vote to give staff direction, <clears throat> excuse me, nor um, um, does the lack of direction from the council this evening, I believe, put a, 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 a final nail in a coffin here. I think it can proceed forward um, for um, the FPPC to um, either give a yay or nay to Council Member Doring's participation. Um, and Certainly, as I said earlier, um, the council is not required to uh, adopt a resolution with respect to the county right. approval this evening. So um, uh, I think in the absence of direction um, to, from the council, and, and it appears there won't be a vote providing direction one way or another to, uh, to staff, the matter can continue to go forward, but it would go forward without staff's involvement at this point. Yes, that's what I understand as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and if I applied uh, anything different, uh, I wasn't speaking with the clarity that uh, uh, I tried to speak to. But yes, I agree, certainly. Uh, okay, uh, that takes us to our next matter. Uh, and we need Mr. Doring back. I thought he went home. <laughs> 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 All right, that takes us to uh, item so late I can't even use the gavel with any force here. <laughs> uh, but let's take us to 9.3. Uh, uh, this deals with, uh, with, with an initiative coming out of the county in which the county is asking each of the uh, city councils to designate two folks to work with two folks uh, from the county uh, with respect to marijuana policy. The county I was at the Board of Supervisors meeting where the county took this up and the two supervisors that uh, they selected for this purpose uh, were, uh, 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 were 
Board of Supervisor Member Celia Ramos and Board of Supervisor Member Ryan Gregory. Uh, my understanding is that the other cities are going to also designate uh, uh, two, and the question is whether we should uh, designate uh, two. Uh, I think we certainly should, and so then the question is, uh, do we have volunteers? Mr. Doring. I will volunteer. I will. All right. Mr. Doring and oh, oh, sure. <laughs> Public comment before we designate. Yeah. I'll be quick. Uh, this is a letter I'd like to submit to the council. Um, I'll be brief. My name is Eric Splower, 1610 Kearney Street. I know that this is specifically about appointing people, but it is about marijuana. Kind of gray area of talking about this in public forum. Um, and there were a lot of people here who had kept waiting. So I'd like to talk just a minute about uh, the letter I'm submitting tonight. Um, I know that the Planning Commission on March 11th passed some additional changes to the ordinance on marijuana in St. Helena. And um, I'm wondering when, when that's going to be heard by the City Council, if it is, or if it already has. It's hard to find that, even with my experience in these issues, on the website, what's already happened on that. So my first question is, has the Planning Commission ordinance been passed up to the Council yet? It has not, and it most likely will be on the next Council agenda. Thank you for that. What my letter is asking for is for the Council to consider at that meeting the possibility of a dispensary in St. Helena. Um, and uh, uh, there's a group of us, who are Napa Valley Fume, who would like to be that first dispensary. The citizens of St. Helena overwhelmingly supported Proposition 64 in November. And I think the Council uh, and the Planning Commission moving quickly to say we're not going to allow any activities in Romero. It is premature. I think there's, we ought to have public forums the way, for instance, Calistoga has to see what the citizenry of St. Helena feels about the issue and, uh, and consider it more broadly before you move on the Planning Commission's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sklar. Any Thank you. further public comment on this one? For the clerk. What's, what, what, the only thing that's before us tonight really is uh, appointing two folks, and we've had two volunteers, uh, Mr. Doring and Mr. Ellsworth. And so the chair would accept a motion to make uh, uh, Council Member Doring and Council Member Ellsworth our, our designees to work with the Board of Supervisors and the designees from the other cities. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to volunteer them anyway. Uh, okay, well, so, I can't uh, wait to hear your reports. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I, I was in communication with the County Executive Officer today and um, Leanne um, said that Supervisor Gregory is out this week and she'll follow up with uh, the first meeting date in the fall. Next week, we'll find out when the next meeting will be, or when the first meeting will be. All right. Uh, and, uh, okay, so we've had a we've had a motion, uh, and we had a second. Who was the second? I think I was the second. Okay. I'll give you first. <laughs> discussion, just a brief discussion. Um, if a meeting with the county occurs before we are able to uh, hear the item that's coming up from the Planning Commission, I would hesitate to uh, get into a whole lot of detail without direction from the entire council. So um, I'd be happy to meet with county representatives, but um, I'd be in a listening mode until I get direction from our entire council, until we really um, weigh in on the issue. Uh, I let the public speak first so that um, we are making decisions or representing the uh, city of St. Helena intelligently. So that, that would just be my only point. Yeah, I, 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 I must that say, uh, uh, Council Member Doring, uh, maybe I'm understanding this not correctly, okay? Uh, but what I perceive happening uh, with respect to this group is that it will discuss the various policy variances. Uh, 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 but I don't think it's looking to commit any particular city to any particular policy. Uh, I think it's more saying here are the choices and here are the considerations that uh, that uh, that you need to take into account uh, coming up with kind of a checklist uh, and possibly uh, with 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 members making some providing some recommendations back to the city but no way binding to the binding the city council at that point. That's what I see happening. Maybe it's a tough balancing act. I would just echo uh, the planning directors for all county jurisdictions that have made efforts to try to keep each other aware of, of decisions regarding medical cannabis and then now recreational cannabis. Uh, and it's my understanding that it, the the goal of this meeting is is to keep each other informed as jurisdictional um, authorities, and then also potentially with the goal of trying to standardize some of the regulations throughout the county. But that uh, hasn't been explicitly suggested based on my discussions with other county directors. Right. Thank you. Uh, and I know that most 
both Mr. Doring and I listened in on an interesting discussion from the California League of Cities the other day, and uh, it certainly struck me that the issues are considerably more complex uh, than I had thought they were. That was what I got out of it. Okay, in any event, we've solved uh, this problem. That takes us to 9.4, and... Uh, Mayor Galbraith, we need a roll call. Oh, all right, roll call. <laughs> and uh, will you please clarify who uh, motioned first, for the record? The motion was to uh, appoint council members Doring and Ellsworth. And who, who made the motion? Mary. I made the motion. Yeah, Ms. Coverstein happened. and Mr. White the seconded. We actually made uh, it at the same time. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> council member Coberstein? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council member Doring? Yes. Ellsworth? Yes. Mayor, Gal Mayor Galbraith? Yes. All right, and that takes us to 9.4, and for reasons I've previously ex explained, uh, I cannot uh, participate in 9.4 as I have no FPPC ruling, and I'm not so, quite frankly, with respect to this issue. And um, I've been advised that I may have a conflict of interest as a licensed helicopter pilot, so I am happy to recuse myself. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> yes. Well, I'd say the next senior person in here is uh, Mr. Do Council Member Doring. <laughs> so let me get let oriented here. We're on. Um, 9.4 of our agenda, and the item is, is discussion and direction regarding proposed correspondence to the Napa County Board of Supervisors regarding private heliport development within the County of Napa. Originally, this was brought forward by Council Member Ellsworth. Um, may we have just a brief uh, comment, staff report from uh, the Planning Department? Uh, so at, at the discussion that was brought forward, I believe at two meetings ago, um, there was some discussion regarding uh, potential impacts or concerns over potential impacts from private heliport use, uh, and council directed staff to prepare a letter um, for the council to review and potentially uh, send to the Napa County Board of Supervisors voicing concerns over that uh, potential impacts of the use or the use in general. Um, however, there was some uh, a variety of opinion expressed at that meeting, and so staff has tried to capture a general position, but is 100% open to hearing direction and editing uh, with regards to the current draft letter before the council. Let me open it up to public uh, hearing for anybody in the audience who wishes to comment. Thank you. Um, I'm Bobby, and speaking as a person. <laughs> A uh, citizen. <laughs> I'm not thinking very well. Well, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I think that these heliports open up the possibility of really offensive noise pollution, and it gives no benefit to the community at large. It's only benefit for the few people who could afford to have a helicopter <laughs> And a helicopter, you know, and to be com coming in and out. There is no way to f to enforce when they would come. I don't think there are any. You, that's you know, if in the middle of the night, all night long, all day long, whatever. It just seems like um, opening Pandora's box in terms of noise pollution, which we've heard a lot about lately. So, I would I would really support um, whatever in this letter is opposed to this this event of having heliports for helicopters in the valley. Thank you. Additional comment? Elaine DeMann, I'll make it brief, what she said. <laughs> Brevity has its purpose. Um, I, sorry, I'm getting used to this. I did want to make an announcement. I think it's important to note that we received, or at least I received uh, uh, today, two letters. Um, in general addressing the issue that we have. One is from the, um, who is this from? Let's see. Let's see. 
There's a Wayne Williams, and it's addressed helicopter landing location discussion in the FFA. Uh, this is a person who's a member of the Los Angeles Area Helicopter Noise Co Coalition. So we have people down south who are interested in our issue or the issue in Napa County. The other one is an email uh, from a, um, a gentleman named Richard Root, board member, Los Angeles Area Helicopter Noise Coalition. Uh, so uh, we put those in the record. Council discussion? Uh, actually, after the last meeting, uh, I reached out to a number of different helicopter coalitions in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and um, through that uh, uh, was introduced to Wayne Williams, who's going to be coming up to comment at the um, at the county meeting in May about this 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 helipad. I, I just want to read a couple little excerpts, and and and. He's part of this Los Angeles coalition as well as this other gentleman. You may. Thank you. Uh, it is critical for this commission to understand that the FAA has – Federal Aviation Ad Administration – has exclusive jurisdiction over aircraft in flight. No other agency at any level of government has any ability to control how pilots fly. The FAA's overriding concern is safety. The FAA does not limit the number of aircraft that can use the airspace, has no minimum noise standards for helicopter flights, nor are there any noise regulations to enforce other than that helicopters are to fly at least 40 feet above an obstruction. Let me repeat, 40 feet above any obstruction. Let this be a cautionary tale for Napa Valley. There are no good solutions to controlling noise from helicopters once they are in the air. That's from Mr. Williams. I'll read briefly from Mr. Roots. Um, the uh, FAA does not limit the number of aircraft that can use the airspace or where they fly, except when near airports or at very high altitudes. It has no noise standards for helicopter flights. It has no net noise regulations to enforce. It does not respond to individual noise complaints. The only action the FAA has been willing to take regarding helicopter flights is to engage in meetings with pilots and ask them to voluntarily do better. Unlike fixed-wing planes, which are required to fly at least 1,000 feet above the ground, the FAA has no required minimum altitude for helicopters. Instead, each pilot decides how high or low to fly. Additional discussion, Mary? Yeah, <clears throat> I agree we need to go on record um, on this issue. And um, I, I don't have any specific comments on the letter. Um, I, I think the idea that we we need more of a planning process about this and some more public input so people understand it is a good way to express our concern. Okay. Um, last chance. I didn't technically close the public hearing. Anything else? Anyone else would like to comment before I close the public hearing? It is closed. Um, I think the one point these letters address, and I think maybe one additional sentence I would put into this um, into this. Um, letter and leave it to your discretion to, to frame the, 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 the sentence but uh, it is important to note that uh, we have very limited jurisdiction that FAA has has very broad jurisdiction and that raises concerns uh, for us and I, I think uh, that would be important to put in this, into this letter um, as a, a point to be made um, and I think all the jurisdictions need to, to understand that also I mean that's the import one of the strongest imports that I get from these two letters that um, once that helicopter is off the ground we really don't have a whole lot of control over it and obviously that is a concern to me uh, so that that that's incumbent upon the the jurisdictions to use their their land use um, authority uh, something like that 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 would be something I would like to see in the letter yes I think that's the point they're making is the one thing we have control over is the is the land use and if we um, if if we you know they as they say w once you let the toothpaste out of the tube, uh, <laughs> um, you don't have you 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 give up the control and um, so 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 making that clear that we don't have any anything else but to try to limit it on the ground and that should to some degree possibly limit at least the point to point. Uh, Travel or Uber model of helicopters, something like that. But but you, I think you <laughs> said it more right. succinct, much more succinct. <laughs> do you need anything else from us? In is that a sufficient direction, or do we need something more formal? No, I, I think that 
uh, staff has a clear understanding. I just mainly wanted to uh, this, uh, to understand whether the council uh, likes the general um, tone of the letter versus focusing on a specific application or looking at it generally. No. And it sounds I'm like comfortable the with the tone of the letter in general. Yes. yes. Is that is that the case, council members? Yes. yes. Okay. So staff will finalize this and and get it sent to the board of supervisors as soon as possible. All right. Thank you. It looks like we are adjourned. We are adjourned. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry.